Welcome committee members, liaisons, and members of the public to the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission meeting. Thank you for joining us. We are using Zoom with a goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you would like to comment during the meeting, please use the raised hand feature. To use the raised hand feature by phone, dial star nine on your phone's dial pad, and the same to lower your hand. Please utilize this tool to virtually indicate that you would like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the discussion. New going forward, all committee meetings will be recorded and posted to the state bar website. A friendly reminder that this is a video conference and to please be aware of your surroundings behind you. Tips for those using Zoom on a computer, when on mute, holding down the space bar, space bar will temporarily unmute. If you use your phone to dial into this meeting, please be sure your computer's microphone is on mute to avoid audio feedback issues. While joining audio via computer is highly recommended, if an individual loses audio, they can call in separately using the Zoom conference number. Thank you. All right, shall we uh, do roll call, please? Great. Rhinus? Here. Savage? Here. Schreiber? Here. Vanarelli? Here. Aglaki? Al Saraf? Here. Ball? Here. White Master? Bennett? Blakemore? Here. Boschelli? Connolly? Here. Friedman? Here. Galkin? Here. Iskin? Here. <clears throat> Judge Klein? Cruz? Lee? Mahoney? Here. Meeker? Here. Judge Askell? Here. Judge Sullivan? We have quorum, let me do um, liaisons and staff. Selena Copeland? Zach Newman? Bonnie Huff? Saw Elizabeth? Crystal? Crystal, you're on? Erica? Uh, yeah. Erica? Michael, I saw Danielle, Chris, Lynn, is Lynn on? She's no, okay, take her. She's on. She's on. Okay, great. And Brady, are you here? Brady's here. Okay, great. Okay, we'll turn it back over to you, um, Kim and Rich. This is uh, our last meeting as co-chairs and on the commission, and Kim and I have some thoughts we'd like to share with you before we uh, take public comment. So Kim, over to you. Sure. Um, there's some construction going on in the building that I'm in, so um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, so I think I've been on like about 10 years and um, it's time to get in some um, fresh folks, fresh new blood, new ideas. Um, I have really enjoyed being on the commission. I've held a lot of different uh, positions um, on committees and then as chair finally I couldn't duck that any longer and I just want to give several comments just looking forward about the commission not really looking back but um, you know my hope is that all the commission members and new ones coming on have a continued dedication to increasing access to justice and overseeing statutory compliance um, and we hold uh, the QLSPs and the support centers to uh, a really very high standard of excellence. But at the same time, I think we need to continue um, granting where necessary and within the parameters of the statute, the kind of exceptions that are necessary for these programs to do their work. And that's because they are working under incredible stress with this really significant 
um, deficit in resources for the kind of problems they're trying to address. So I hope the commission continues to do what they have done over the course of the preceding years, which is acknowledge that um, not every um, uh, deadline or uh, can always be met with, with perfection and that they are laboring under incredible um, amounts of work with um, you know, a need to once in a while be granted an exception or waiver of specific deadline. Um, the, the third thing I'd like to say is that I would like the commission members to continue to be respectful of the structure of the commission. And what I mean by that is we can't function unless we have these hardworking committees. And that being said, when a committee comes forward to the commission, I hope the commissioners will respect their hard work, acknowledge it, and not have to basically start the whole analytical process again. And that means having trust in commissioners and having trust in the committee process. I think that's very important. Um, the other aspect of commission structure that I wanna mention is the partnership with the staff and it's essential. None of us would be very good commissioners um, without the staff. None of us would understand any of this <laughs> without the staff. They take a deep dive, they work incredible hours, and um, we need to understand we're in a partnership with them, but also really respect their role. We don't, as commissioners, we don't micromanage staff. Um, and I think it's really important that we respect their role um, as well as being in partnership with them. Um, and the final thing I want to say is actually a look back, which is to thank the staff. The entire time I've been on the commission, they have been absolutely remarkable. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Um, I, I, the two of us leave with a lot of institutional knowledge, and I'll take uh, uh, just a moment to remind you that of some thoughts that came to me as I'm leaving uh, with respect to the 2018-2019 the stakeholders working group, which I co-chaired. Uh, several of you, Corey and Chris uh, and Jim, uh, were participants in that and others. Um, there were five meetings of representatives of the legislature, the State Bar Board of Trustees, uh, qualified legal service providers like Catherine, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. commissioners uh, attended, uh, as well as representatives of the Judicial Council. And it was there to study a recommendation that the commission be either eliminated or severely reduced in size. At the conclusion of the meetings, a functional matrix was presented that proposed changes in responsibilities as between staff, the commission, and the board of trustees. Recommendations were made to the legislature and as of 2022, statutes were amended to limit the Board of Trustees responsibilities with respect to IOLTA and other grants made by the commission. Recommendations that the number of commissioners uh, be reduced or the commission be eliminated were rejected. I applaud those changes. Those were needed. Operationally, it was not feasible for the Board of Trustees to be held responsible to the public as a fiduciary when the commission, not the board of trustees performed the diligence required of a fiduciary. And the work is especially demanding. It's demanding of staff as Kim just mentioned. And you've seen evidence of that at every meeting, you will see it today. State bar work is exhausting and it's expanding at a rate faster than the rate of hire. We made grants in greater amount this year than in the history of the commission. That takes considerable work, which will be displayed. You will see it on display at its finest today. And as to you, it takes careful oversight. The oversight exercise by the commission is my focus. That's really what I wanna leave you with. As I said in January of 2019, exercising a fiduciary duty takes more than listening to detailed reports. It requires a skeptical and inquisitive approach and it improves with experience. Your terms are four years and that's not a mistake. There's a good reason for that. 
This is intentional. You will learn over those years the complexity of this process, and you will be vigilant as to how the people's money is distributed. That's your duty. And you must always ask yourself, are we as commissioners apportioning these funds in the best possible way to provide free legal services to California's indigent population? Are we fulfilling the promise of the IELTA program? It's an ingenious program. Are we fulfilling that promise and can we do it better? Today, the Rules Committee will present to you the arduous work of the, this committee, ably chaired by Amin al Saraf, is a byproduct of the working group and the 2019 recommendations to the legislature. This is an effort to document rules and guidelines that Tim just referred to for grant making in the spirit of transparency and disclosure to potential grantees and to the public, but it's a trap for the unwary. It may be seen as removing reasonable judgment. Kim just urged you to continue to use reasonable judgment. Don't be caught in the trap. Your judgment will be tested by many decisions proposed by staff. Remain skeptical and inquisitive. You will be asked to support staff and given their superb work, that's not a big ask. But there's more to the job than applauding good work. Commissioners are not audience. Commissioners are actors with fiduciary responsibilities. I wanna reiterate what I stated three years ago. I ask you to think like an operator with boots on the ground. Ask yourself, how realistic is it for staff to be granted more unilateral authority without increasing operations risks? You as commissioners ought to be very unnerved by suggestions that you downstream responsibilities. Shifting responsibilities in that direction is not the action of a prudent fiduciary. It places the operations personnel, the staff at risk. It puts them more in the shoes of being grantor and in greater proximity to grantees. And the greater that proximity, the greater the risks. A final point that's bothered me for 10 years. How effective is our funding in improving the lives of California's indigent population? You fully understand that's the ultimate goal here. The responsibilities of this commission as to the IOLTA monies that we are distributing and other monies that we distribute don't end when the grants are made. How much of our time is dedicated to evaluation? Do we have data to support the proposition that the purposes of the enabling legislation are being fulfilled? Might we make funding decisions differently if we knew more about the results of the work of legal service providers funded by the commission? Professor Meeker has left his mark on this commission. We need data to help us direct money in the most effective manner. And some information is regularly collected. I urge you during the next few years to embark on a program designed to answer these questions. I'm not worried about the risks of collecting data. The work is good and it's worthy, but it's not enough to say we just don't have enough information. Make every penny count. Demand that grantees upstream to staff and staff to you the results of their work so that you can improve this ingenious program. As grant makers, you have at your disposal a fabulous team. Harness that energy to serve more, increase access, and expand the welcoming arms of justice to those in need. <clears throat> and now on to the public. Any members of the public on the phone? Or attending by Zoom? Um. There's a couple. You have um, Zach Newman from LAC. There's an Amy Sunga um, and a Shelby Knox. <clears throat> Any members of the public wish to make a comment? And I'll uh, reserve the right as chair and co chair to limit any presentations to two minutes. Uh, nobody's indicating that they want to speak. Okay. Um, we had a discussion, uh, Rich and Dwan and I, yesterday about the, the, the length of this agenda for the meeting. 
And um, so we are going to try to keep to a very uh, tight timeline. And there may, may be a point at which we politely uh, end, end discussion on an item. So we're just kind of letting you know that in, in advance as we start to move through the, through the agenda. So I think we're now on item three, consent. Go ahead, Jim. Um, we need an approval on the meeting summary and action items from the June 17th, 2022 meeting. Everybody have an opportunity to re review that meeting summary? I did, Kim, and I'm happy to make that motion for you. Okay, thank you. I can second. Okay, thank you. Um, Rhinus? Yay. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Vanarelli? Yes. Oglagi? Alsaroff? Yes. Ball? Yes. Fightmaster? Bennett? Blakemore? Yes. Bushelli? Connolly? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Gawkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. Judge Klein? Yes. Cruz? Lee? Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Abstain. Motion passes. Thank you. Dwan, why don't you continue uh, for um, agenda item four, recent developments? Sure, um, I just wanna make a, a, a few announcements. I sent out an email a, a few weeks ago about um, Erica Connolly's reappointment um, to the commission um, as a state bar appointment. So I just wanna congratulate Erica again. And then um, an, another new development um, that we recently heard just a few days ago is Catherine Blakemore, um, whose term is up this year, um, is going to be reappointed as a Senate appointment. Um, so again, um, congratulations both uh, Catherine and Erica, and we really look forward to working with you um, another term. Um, an another um, update from the staff is that we have hired four new staff who will be getting um, in the next couple months. We only, after those four new staff come on, we only have one more open position and then we will finally be um, fully staffed. And, um, you know, for the commissioners that have been on, um, you, you know, we've grown in size. We're going to be doubling in size um, from the last, uh, you know, to two, four years ago. Um, this is really a testament um, to kind of the great work uh, the staff and the commission do in partnership with each other and with increased funding. Um, so we're really excited and we'll introduce the new staff at the next commission meeting. Um, and then also just on behalf of the staff, I, I do wanna um, thank uh, the commission um, for, uh, for all your hard work this year since this is the last meeting of the term. Um, you know, we've gone through um, pretty turbulent years, I would say the last three or four years, but I, from our vantage point, I think we're in a very, very good place. Um, there's been a lot of stability, uh, particularly the last um, two years. Um, the partnership is, is very strong between the commission and, 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 um, and the staff, and we welcome that. Um, and I was just at the Eligibility Budget Review Committee meeting earlier this, um, this morning, um, and, and you'll get a full report, but I'm really just proud to say that the, the, the work of the eligibility committee and the rules committee and our efforts to bring kind of more clarity to the grants making process has really um, kind of proven you'll, you'll hear because we didn't have a single eligibility review conference this year. There weren't any substantial issues. And I th really do think that that is a testament um, to the great work that we've been doing to bring that kind of consistency and the transparency to our grant making. Um, so again, thank you on behalf of the staff. Um, one, one last update is that the State Bar did issue a diversity report card earlier um, this week. I will be sending out a link. Um, we are very proud of that report. There are many of our staff members um, in this office that participated in that. So um, I, I just want to thank the staff for that. And I'll send that out. And then Brady has an update on um, conflict. So I'll turn it over to Brady. Um, uh, sorry, I, very briefly, um, at the last meeting we had spoken um, I, I think we might have even done a, a conflicts training again, but uh, we sent out shortly after the meeting a um, just a list of a few questions. Hopefully it takes five to 10 minutes to answer those. And um, we've received um, responses from about half of you, so thank you. Um, but um, Dwan, um, or, uh, we will be sending out an, another, um, another uh, questionnaire uh, about potential conflicts uh, that we need to be aware of. And, um, just as a, um, a preview, we have known conflicts um, from those of you who responded 
um, for three of the items, the uh, partnership grant approval, the um, um, IELTA and EAF eligibility uh, uh, recommendation, and the um, uh, pro bono allocation allocation. Uh, so on those business items, uh, we'll remind you before the vote, but um, those of you who have a, a, a current or recent um, relationship with a, a, a grantee affected by those, um, we will just ask that you, um, when you make your vote, you abstain with respect to um, that organization. Um, and then I'll go on to the next agenda item, which is um, the staff update on the loan repayment assistance program. Um, so at the last commission meeting, um, we had reported out that at that time, um, the, the Senate and the the Senate and the Assembly had come um, out with uh, had published a proposed um, state budget, and in that there was a line item for a, a statewide loan repayment assistance program of 55 million. Unfortunately, um, it did go to the governors, and it was um, eliminated from the ultimate budget. Um, there's still a, a minor possibility that it might be resurrected, and um, there's uh, I guess it's, it's like junior budget language which is getting negotiated now. So there's a very, very small chance that it might come back in, in some small form. Um, we'll keep you all apprised. Uh, there is still a working group um, that, that is working, um, that's comprised of Legal Service Trust One Commission, uh, members, Access Commission, and the Council on Access and um, Fairness, as well as State Bar staff and LAC. Um, and we'll, we'll continue to move forward to see if we can salvage something from that. And I'll, give, I'll provide more of an update at the next commission meeting. Go on, um, how much how much money was anticipated to be allocated to that 50, program? 55 million over five years is that the program i can't recall right now i think it's it might have been over three or five years um erica do you, do you remember that off the top of your head if you're on or air catherine i think it's over five years over five years okay thank you um rich kim can we proceed with um the next Agenda item. It's a uh, thy ultra revenue from um, myself and Michael. Please do. Okay. Great. Um, so, so Michael's prepared a few slides for you um, to go over the IELTA uh, revenue projections. Um, we wanted to keep you apprised because uh, the Federal Reserve did meet a couple of weeks ago, um, and the interest rates went up a little bit more than we had um, anticipated from our the last time we met and we uh, discussed kind of IELTA projections. Um, we were anticipating that the Federal Reserve would be increasing at pretty much every meeting this year. Um, we, we were thinking it would be more on the lines of 50 basis point. Um, the Federal Reserve and it's good news has gone up 75 basis point. So that will be good for um, you know, our bottom line for IOLTA. The other update, and um, I sent an email saying that um, Wells Fargo was um, considering pulling out of our um, leadership bank program. Since that time, they have decided to remain. So with those kind of two, two, two things in play, uh, Michael is going to be um, running through um, what that means um, for our revenue projection. Um, so Michael, are you on? Do you wanna share screen? Michael, you're on mute. That would help. So sorry about that. Um, as uh, Duan said, I uh, prepared a couple of quicks, uh, a quick slide um, to provide a good overview of the update um, based upon the recent um, increase in rates uh, that was a little higher than originally anticipated. Uh, under column D, uh, under the blue heading, these were the amounts that were approved um, by the board and yourselves in about a month ago. Um, and as a part of um, those uh, projections, there has definitely been an increase. Um, and so the effort is to compare and contrast uh, column B through uh, D, which are reflective of actual interest um, collected from January through June, uh, and also updated projections um, from the most recent uh, Fed meetings. And so for 2022, just on the revenue-based side, um, there's an anticipated increase of around $3 million, and it's uh, equivalent to about 9.12% of, of just um, revenue. 
when I carry that forward and anticipate for 2023, um, there's another $3 million increase just based off of those uh, assumption changes. So in total between 22 and three, um, the anticipated increases in revenue is over 6 million. Uh, so around seven and a half percent. Um, you know, the board, Fed board still has three more meetings left this year. Uh, they're meeting in September, I want to say November and December. Um, it, it's still sort of un, known as to how uh, much um, they'll actually react and raise rates. Um, but potentially rates will um, still, still move um, towards the higher range. And um, so there's going to be definitely a, a sense of focus on what happens in the next three months uh, with respect to uh, the Fed, Fed's decision on interest rates. Uh, and as Duan had mentioned, uh, due to Wells Fargo's notification to us that they were reviewing potentially dropping out of the leadership program and alternatively paying a um, comparable interest uh, for IOLTA. Um, we, we did prepare a separate scenario just to display and contrast what that type of a sort of um, action would equate to. So let me open that up and you can see. Um, so under this alternate scenario, um, if we had lost Wells Fargo um, to the comparable rate basis and they made that change, um, in 22, there isn't as big of a, a decrease in terms of revenue. Um, where we do see the activity uh, in terms of uh, the variation in the decrease in revenue is in 2023. Um, they provide a notification to us that if they were to uh, drop out of the leadership pro bank program, they would be only paying 40 basis points on their IOLTA deposits. And it's anticipated that, um, you know, in 2023, our, our IOLTA ECR and leadership rates would um, be north of 1.7%. Uh, so there is a very big difference in what they would pay under comparable rate structures versus the leadership bank structure. Uh, so as a comparison, the 22 and 23 revenue base, if Wells Fargo had flipped, would be over $8 million in terms of a revenue loss. Um, again, you know, we are definitely very cognizant and diligent um, about which banks are potentially asking for recertification and uh, would uh, impact uh, the IOLTA revenue stream. Uh, and we'll definitely uh, keep everyone apprised of that as best we can. But that's pretty much it. Michael, I, I've got a question for you. Sure. I can't, for some reason, I can't, uh, the chat function's been blocked here, but uh, I mean, the uh, hand up function has been. Uh, this assumes that trust deposits remain constant. Yes. Um, so in the original assumptions, as a part of what was uh, presented and approved, there was um, incorporated into those projection models um, a a decrease, right, in the overall depositories in anticipation of um, banks wanting to control costs. Um, and, and so the only thing that was in particular, that was a little surprising is really Wells Fargo um, potentially dropping out. We, did, we really didn't think that that was gonna be a possibility with them, that they would even raise their hands to um, potentially notify and ask. But, I think it just goes to show that um, the financial institutions participation in the leadership and ECR programs are, um, you know, sort of very uh, unpredictable. What percentage of IOLTA revenue do we receive from Wells Fargo? Um, 
when I looked at the projection model um, at the time, their depository balance comprised of 46% of all banks that were paying ECR and leadership bank rates. And I wanna say with respect to the actual interest that they were paying, it was 36%. So they are from a concentration risk standpoint, there is concentration risk in the portfolio um, yeah, no, I, because that, of some point. of these bigger players. That, that's a very important point. It would behoove the commission over time to expand the number of banks that are in the program to, re, to dilute the impact of losing one from 170 basis points down to 40 is a big blow to us. We are relying on the constancy of uh, IOLTA flow. The more banks that are involved in that program, the less vulnerable the commission would be to having to adjust its grant making. Corey's got her hand up. I just have um, a quick question, which is, is there any correlation between this changing rate environment and the likelihood of banks staying in, in or out of the, of the program? Um, you know, when we started looking at the projections for this year, um, one of one step of the process was looking at the last time um, we had this very drastic change in the rate environment, which was, uh, I want to say March or April of 2020. Um, and in that time, it was almost the inverse type of reaction. We went from a very high um, rate environment to all of a sudden virtually nothing in terms of the overnight fit funds rate. And looking at looking at, I think, some of the reactions for the bank. At the time, there were financial institutions that did re want to recertify to control their costs because they all of a sudden were paying us a very high rate and um, they could alternatively go to a very low rate structure, which is typical for the comparable uh, products. Um, so it, it is anticipated that um, you know, there is a direct correlation between the rate environment and participation in the leadership in the ECR bank programs. So usually the higher the rate, we would anticipate um, banks to control costs and, and maybe uh, avert from participating. Any further questions or comments for Michael? Jacob's Michael? got his hand up. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, so I appreciate that Wells Fargo has kind of expressed a willingness to stay committed to the program. I, I'm curious if there's any length of time that binds them to that commitment or if they could change their mind in the future and walk away. As we're looking at projections through 2023, I'm somewhat concerned if they've telegraphed uh, a willingness to step back. Yes, so that's a great question. Um, and you know, unfortunately, there there isn't anything uh, contractually that would bind a, a financial institution to be retained in the leadership of bank programs. They they honestly can opt out at any given point in time, which which is why I think we were wanting to try to provide some sense of what would happen to the revenue stream if uh, Wells Fargo all of a sudden, let's say. Um, on the very next Fed funds rate meeting, if the Fed um, reacts to the jobs report or inflation, what have you, and increases rates another 75 basis points, that all of a sudden would be the tipping point for Wells and they would flip. Um, so the alternate scenario that I showed earlier had that sort of timing in, in mind that we would lose them starting like, let's say October going forward how that would look for us. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, um, there, there really isn't anything that would bind a, a financial institution, like I mentioned, to, to stay put. Catherine? <clears throat> Thank you. I, I just wondered, given you know, what's really a very quickly changing interest rate environment, if there's a committee of the trust fund commission that looks at 
you know, sort of the program parameters and whether there's reasons to adjust it in some way or have different tiers of what the leadership means or, you know, just sort of re, re, take a refresh look at it um, as a way of minimizing, you know, future, the sort of future pro projections that Michael has talked about. So just, um, I don't, there might already be something and if not, it's just uh, a suggestion for us to think about in the, in the coming year. Um, so there used to be a committee um, to do that type of work. I can't remember exactly right now what, um, what it's called, but it, it's been phased out over the years. Um, Elizabeth and uh, Michael and I have been um, strategizing, you know, given what happened with Wells recently, that we definitely should be a bit more proactive instead of kind of reactionary. Um, so one of the things that we would like to do is um, revisit the leadership bank program um, in total and see if there's something we could do um, to, to generate more interest, more participation, um, and perhaps um, having a working group. And maybe that working group is comprised of commissioners, but we're thinking um, maybe it might be beneficial um, to have it even beyond trust fund commissioners. Um, so we're happy to work up a proposal and bring it forward to the commission's consideration in November. That'd be amazing. Thanks so much. <clears throat> I can't. No, I can't see if there's any more hands. Chris, Chris has his hand up. Okay, great. Um, I think it was called parody or something like that. It, it was the name of the, the. Oh, is that what it was called? It was something. It was something like that. I. It was back in Stephanie's uh, time, I believe. So the thing I was going to ask is whether shame plays any role in this, and. Um, and whether to look at the sort of positive side of that, say that, you know, recognizing the importance of Wells Fargo's role in the delivery of legal services, whether there is some recognition, public recognition, we could arrange for a state bar meeting and or a commission meeting to sort of trumpet and celebrate their decision to remain a leader um, in this area. And, and so I, I guess I'd, you know, offer the carrot to see if that is, a, is an inducement to sort of remain on board. So, I mean, I've raised that also somehow having some sort of publicity for the banks that participate. And, and Duan, I think you said that there is something that's being done, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's for a very wide audience, you know? Yeah, so um, we're, we're gonna be doing some research because there are some um, kind of advertising kind of rules that we have to look into to see um, what we can, you know, publicize and, and, and you know, tout the good work and, and what are those prohibitions are. We haven't done a deep dive to say, um, so I don't know what the limitations are um, because one thing that I have, we, Elizabeth and I have been talking is like, um, is it possible to, you know, advertise very, I don't want to use that word, but, you know, promote very widely that these are our leadership bank programs and maybe, um, you know, uh, uh, attorneys or law firms that want to, you know, bank with these would increase, you know, access to justice and um, would can generate more revenue. We, we don't know that's possible. So this is why we're proposing like a committee working group or what whatnot to take a really deep dive and go through kind of the options. But like Chris, yeah, that 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 is a, a good suggestion. So I think there is a little of history too, um, by the way, which is that when we were in a, de a declining rate environment, really low rates, which we were for many, many, many years, as I recall, the banks did not want us to, did not want the bar to speak too loudly about their participation because they had other account holders who were not getting as good of a rate. So I, I do recall that, and obviously that's not the situation right now. But there's that that's that's part of the, the the history of it, I think. And then the one one related piece of that is like we have a floor for our rates, which is um, a sixty eight basis point or sixty eight. I can't remember the exact phrasing of it. Um, and the commission sets that. And so um, you know, Elizabeth and Michael and I have been talking because. Um, we probably should we could take a dive at that and see if that that should be the floor in anticipation of the next time um, you know rates drop. I mean they're on a, a incline right now, but they will drop again at some point so that mm -hmm. we're better prepared. Um, it felt 
too low for us this past time. But again, we, we need to do more analysis um, to make sure that that conclusion um, isn't just like a feeling, but it's based on something. All right, uh, for the sake of uh, moving ahead and not uh, uh, lengthening our agenda, let's move on to um, uh, item five on our agenda uh, and Kim and Chris to discuss uh, appointments. Right, um, I think Christian is going to take this on and this will be very brief, Christian. Yes, um, Kim and I, uh, in conjunction with State Bar staff, uh, participated in uh, the process of reviewing and um, interviewing several candidates for the next set of commissioners. And um, I, I just say by way of background, it was a very, uh, it, it's a new process for us because after the passage of the latest legislation, the state bar, or excuse me, the trust fund commission has new appointment authority, which we haven't had in the past. Um, as Kim mentioned, uh, and Rich, you know, both, uh, and this includes me as well, but we've all been on the commission for a long time. We have seen how many people apply. And this year, the pool of applicants that applied was uh, larger than I can remember it ever being. It was filled with uh, a, a real uh, abundance of compelling candidates. Uh, Kim and I, as liaisons to the commission, interviewed several candidates with Duan as well in attendance, and we have included a recommendation uh, that three candidates be uh, adopted by the commission as uh, new commissioners subject to the commission's approval. Uh, they are in the memo uh, on page uh, three and four of the memo about the vacant positions. And I should just note that a couple of the vacant positions um, were, or one of the vacant positions uh, was uh, opened up by the untimely passing of Bob Planthold. And uh, two other uh, positions um, would be filled by these new um, candidates. So the three individuals that Kim and I recommended we did keep in mind uh, the slots that people were going to be filling. We were also mindful of sort of background of the individuals as well as geography yeah. and trying to just reach across the state. So the first individual is Angie King. She's a public interest lawyer uh, in San Luis Obispo in this, on the Central Coast. Um, uh, second is uh, Dr. Vanetta Campbell. She's a professor and uh, not an attorney um, with a, a school of social at the School of Social Welfare, but really has a social work background. Uh, and another individual, Xavier Xavier Vargas, uh, out of Los Angeles. He has a business background. Um, he's currently working for an organization that works with uh, charter schools in Los Angeles. Um, again, I think everyone should they become should they be approved, everyone will find uh, them to be very compelling, interesting, hardworking uh, individuals who I think will add a lot to the commission. And I just would note just as a process matter for Kim and myself, uh, I think I have another year left on the commission, but um, it's exciting to bring in new perspectives. Uh, it is bittersweet because we are letting people uh, uh, go, so to speak, um, walk away. And that's really, a, I think the bittersweet part of this is saying goodbye to people that are highly motivated, experienced, et cetera. But as with any board and leadership organization, the entry of new perspectives, I think is really important. So these are the three recommendations that Kim and I have made and happy to answer any questions that people may have, but uh, yeah, we think they're gonna be great. And there were a lot of other qualified candidates, both that we interviewed as well as 
um, candidates who on paper look terrific that we didn't interview. Uh, and that includes, by the way, um, current commissioners who, uh, who, as Rich noted, are, are terming off. So Chris, we need a resolution if the, once we are finished with comments. Yes, yeah, so I, I think, Duan, sorry, go ahead. I, I do have a, a resolution to share. Mm -hmm. um, do, if you would like me to share now or if you want me to wait until after discussion or questions. Yeah, I think it probably makes sense to share it now. And, and I'm assuming, by the way, that none of the three candidates are public members currently at the in the queue. Is that right, Kim? Wormsley? Excuse me, what was the question? Oh, Kim, do you see um, Angie, Vanetta, or Xavier in, in the queue? I, I don't no, see them. No, I don't. Okay. okay. Thank you. And can you all see this? I just, I shared my screen. And I, I can read it. It says, um, resolve that the Legal Service Trust Fund Commission, upon recommendation of appointment liaisons, approve the appointment of Angie King, Vanetta Campbell, and Xavier Vargas for single terms running from September 1st, 2022 through um, August 31st, 2026. Do I have a motion? I'll move. I'll, thanks, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second. Christina and Chris. Roll call. Rhinus? Aye. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Vanarelli? Yes. Aglagi? Asaraf? Yes. Ball? Yes. Fightmaster? Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Blakemore? Bushelli? Connolly? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. Judge Klein? Judge Klein? Judge Klein is uh, on screen, but uh, apparently not available right now. Cruz? Lee Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Motion passes. Um, may I say one more thing related um, to, to new appointments? Is it okay, Kim and Rich? Sure, please. Um, so unfortunately, we are unable to announce um, the whole slate of new commissioners. Um, we have still um, pending um, judicial council appointments as well as two seats um, that will be filled by the legislature. Um, so we, we can't properly say a goodbyes. We know um, for certain that, you know, like Kim and Corey did not um, reapply for appointments, um, but we, we it's, it, it's still, um, it's, applications are still pending and the seats on the judicial council side and the, the um, uh, uh, legislative side um, have not been official. So um, as soon as we know, we'll send out an email, but we would love to invite um, everybody back to the next commission meeting. Um, we're going to be trying to do it in person. And I don't know if you all recall, but um, when we were in person, that November meeting was 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 the kind of um, our opportunity to say a proper thanks and goodbye. So I'll send out a follow up email, but um, I hope everybody can come back and we can see each other in person. Yes, yeah. thank you, Dwan. <laughs> Two, two quick points about that. First, I hope you are all aware of the new legislation and the appoint of powers of the various bodies that appoint commissioners. It's important in the future that in order for us to meet, among other things, diversity and geography goals, uh, that all of those appointed bodies work together um, so that the commission uh, is diverse and it represents the entire state. So I hope in the future that will be the case. And the second point I wanna make was, we did not have a nominating committee until uh, the beginning of Kim's uh, uh, term and mine as chairs this year. It was Kim's suggestion that we create a nominating committee and lo and behold, we received uh, more applications than we've had in, in recent history and, and wonderful applicants uh, at that. So mm -hmm. thank Kim for, for chairing that and coming up with the idea. All right, let's move on to item five uh, uh, B, uh, the partnership grants. Okay, I think I think that's me, Rich. Um, and uh, 
Let's see. Yeah. So I can keep this and Crystal, I don't know whether whether you're here not seeing you, but I think I can keep this mercifully brief given the length of the agenda. The Partnership Grants Committee, I think most of you are familiar with partnership grants. They are joint projects, the um, uh, legal service organizations and courts to uh, provide um, seminars and things of that nature to help self-help litigants, for example, in small claims court or in conservatorships or guardianships, things of that nature. And we've been doing this for years. The committee this year received 31 proposals from 22 qualified legal services projects requesting about 2.9 million in grants. And at the time uh, the committee first convened, we weren't sure how much money we would have. We weren't sure if we would have 2.8 million to fund everything or less than that. And so we approached uh, a review of these projects as we have done for years. Um, by looking at them in accordance with a, a rubric that is uh, familiar to most people that consists of um, you know things like project impact budget things of that nature we've discussed the rubric in prior meetings and we came up with a couple of different scenarios we rated all of the projects and we, and we found all of them to be worthwhile with with one exception riverside legal aid uh, because there were some deficiencies um, in the proposal in terms of project impact and budget uh, but we found all of them worthwhile. We rated them all, and we came up with a scenario to fund, um, you know, based upon how much money was going to be available. But the good news is that after the budgeting process uh, completed, we learned that there was more funding available for partnership grants than than had been applied for. So we were able to fund all of the projects um, uh, 100 percent, and that's what we're recommending that we do with one exception, that is the Riverside Legal Aid Project. So I don't know whether, Crystal, do you have a chart that you can project? Yeah, it's in the attach, um, the attachment, but I'm happy to pull it. It was an attachment now. to the memo that everybody got, but the bottom line is that we're recommending that we fund in full every project except one. And there would be a total of $2.7 million funded uh, we have something like 3.5 million available. The excess would go back. Where would the excess go? The unfunded amounts? What happens to that? It goes back to the reserves. Okay. Uh, yeah, reserves. So while you're looking, maybe we can find the resolution. So here's the the um, attachment C, which has the uh, funding recommendations from the July 21st meeting. Um, and then I can share my screen uh, once everyone has had a few minutes to look at it to um, put the proposed resolution on screen. So 2.786, so three four is a total um, recommended amount for allocation um, across these projects with the exception of Riverside Legal Aid. And any questions? Yeah, I, Crystal, do you have the chart that is on page four that shows the substantive areas? Yeah, I can scroll down. This is just the yeah. copy of the memo. Four, sorry. That's the rubric you're asking for, Rich? No, I, I, it's just- Oh, a, it's up, okay, okay, I see what you mean, yeah. I mean, one, one of the things that I think yeah. frequent commissioners get asked is what are the free right. services that are requested right. Are worked on by uh, California's legal service providers, right. and it's important for us all to understand how broad the field of services is, and how much you can see from this uh, how important the work is, uh, and, and so many different areas of every aspect of the lives of the clients. So, I just wanted to emphasize the fact that this is a very worthwhile program. Uh, and uh, we, we are helping to solve problems in all of these substantive areas. Uh, it's something we ought to be quite proud of. Great. Actually, the resolution language is, is in this memo too. So I have to, um, it's this one here. Let's wrap it up. All right, I'll need a motion uh, unless there are questions about this. Well, Catherine moves the motion. Catherine uh, makes the motion. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Uh, let's go with Jeff on the second and take a roll call, please. Grinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Vanarelli? 
Yes. Oglagi, Al Saraf. Yes. Ball. Yes. White Master. Bennett. Yes. Blakemore. Yes. Bashelli. Connolly. Yes. Friedman. Yes. Galkin. Yes. Iskin. Yes. Judge Klein. Yes. Cruz. Lee. Mahoney. Yes. Meeker. Yes. Motion passes. Sorry, Dewan, I, I failed to mention I need to abstain with respect to LAFLA. Okay, great, thank you. All right, we are on, on the agenda items C and D, which I would like to combine. Uh, and Erica and Erica are doing those, not as combined, individually, two Erica's. We do synchronized uh, presentations now. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I think Erica Carroll's actually gonna take the lead on this one. Thank you. Um, so the two agenda items that we'll be covering are um, the grant year 2023 IELTA and EAF eligibility, um, as well as eligibility for a pro bono allocation in the coming grant year. Um, so the eligibility and budget review committee um, deals primarily with the IELTA and equal access fund formula grants, which are sort of the foundational Grants administered by the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission. Um, there are two types of grantees uh, that would be eligible for these grants. One are the qualified legal services projects, which are the uh, primarily direct service providers that need a primary purpose of providing free civil legal services to indigent persons. Um, and then the second type of grantee are support centers, which are the organizations that provide uh, legal technical assistance, training, and advocacy support to the QLSPs and pro bono attorneys. Um, so the committee has spent uh, the past several months since applications came in in May, um, reviewing these applications and any major eligibility issues uh, along with staff um, and has the ultimate eligibility recommendations uh, for your consideration today. So this grant cycle, we received 102 applications um, 81 were from qualified legal services projects and 21 were from support centers. Um, staff has completed a review of all of those applications. And uh, as I mentioned, we've gone through a number of eligibility questions at the committee level. So um, audit extension requests, which are a necessary component to have a complete application. Um, those are usually due in May. A number of grantees had trouble making that deadline this year, so they uh, requested extensions. Those were considered back in June. Um, the committee also addressed uh, primary purpose. Um, so organizations that uh, have 75% or more of their qualified expenditures devoted to either, in the case of QLSPs, uh, free civil legal services, or in the case of support centers to their legal support services. Those are presumed eligible for funding, but there are some organizations that fall below that 75% threshold um, and so uh, those applications were reviewed uh, more closely by the committee as well. Um, there are uh, applicants seeking a pro bono al allocation, which I'll go into a little bit more later. Um, but those who don't meet a quantitative test, they need to provide a narrative description, which was something that was discussed at the committee level. Um, support centers that aren't in existence before December 31st, 1980. Uh, they go through a deeming process, which is a voting process by the QLSPs, indicating that they are of special need. The services that they provide are of special need to the QLSP community. Um, and then any, these are, so that's sort of the standard list of issues that the committee deals with. Um, and then any other non-qualifying or potentially non-qualifying work would be reviewed by the committee. But um, I think as Dwan mentioned earlier this year, we actually didn't have any uh, major questions uh, regarding non-qualifying work. So uh, there were no um, review conferences held this year. So the committee uh, met this morning, and as you may have seen in your materials, are recommending 101 applicants as eligible for funding in the coming grant year. Um, the only applicant that is not recommended as eligible is the Santa Barbara County Immigrant Legal Defense Center. They are an applicant for first-time funding um, back in June, they had submitted an application that didn't contain um, an audit or a reviewed financial statement. 
Um, they had requested an extension in order to provide one, but ultimately the commission had decided that uh, the, the circumstances that they cited were didn't constitute extraordinary circumstances, which is the standard um, for granting the audio extension. And so um, they were not granted that extension and consequently that left them with an incomplete application. Um, so staff informed them of that decision back in June and the organization indicated that they understood and wouldn't be moving forward with the application, um, but they never actually officially withdrew. And so their application technically is pending. Um, and that's why they are recommended as ineligible um, or having a determination of ineligibility in 2023, but they would be welcome to come back um, to apply in future years um, with a complete application. Are there any um, questions about uh, the list that was provided or any of the requirements for eligibility? Great. Um, so uh, the proposed resolution is on the screen for the, uh, the eligibility question. And then um, as Brady had mentioned for individuals who um, need to abstain as to particular organizations, you can do so. <clears throat> do I hear a motion? This is Erica, I'll make the motion. Second. I can second. Eric is second. A roll call, please. Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Uh, yes, but with the abstentions, should we note all of them now or do we? Yes, let's note yeah. them now, Chris. Um, impact Fund, Legal Aid at Work, and uh, Community Legal Services of East Palo Alto. Thank you. Vanarelli? Yes. Aglagi? Al Saraf? Yes, uh, except an abstaining for LAFLA. Ball? Jeff Ball? Are, is Jeff still I've had a drop off at one. Fightmaster? Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Yes, abstention as to Disability Rights California. Bushelli? Connolly? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Galkin? Yes. <clears throat> yes, abstain as to Bates Edek. And by the way, can you show that on the partnership grants vote as well? That abstention. Yes. Judge Klein? Yes. Cruz Lee Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes, abstain as to the Orange County Public Law Center. Thank you. Motion passes. Do you want me to jump in for a second? Of course. Uh, sorry, everyone. I, I keep looking down at my email right when the vote starts. You guys are too quick. Um, but it sounds like uh, everybody mostly caught it. And I, I will just preemptively say, um, in, in case that happens again for this next one, the pro bono allocation, um, the impacted organizations are Eric with Bet Zedek, um, Joseph Lee with Disability Rights Legal Center, and um, Jim with Public Law Center. Again, and that's it on that one. So Brady, does that mean we don't have to say it every time? I, you know, I think for best practice would be to to do so, um, okay. just so we have it in the in the record. And that that that's the the best practice and the one that we follow at the board of trustees. Rather than a continuing abstention. Yeah. Okay, on to pro bono. Yes. So. Um organizations that are, are eligible for IELTS and EAF funding, um, qualified legal services projects can apply um, for an additional allocation um, that we refer to as the pro bono allocation. In order to be eligible for this additional funding, uh, they would need to demonstrate that their principal means of service delivery is through the recruitment um, and service services of pro bono attorneys um, or pro bono volunteers. So, um, mm -hmm. An organization that's eligible not only receives additional funding, so 10% of the funding in every county, according to the, the formula, is reserved for these organizations. Um, so they would get additional funding, and then they are also able to use a different income threshold um, under the statute. So organizations seeking the allocation, um, qualified legal services projects can apply 
in various counties throughout the state. And so they would need to meet the requirements in any county where they want the allocation. So they, they can qualify in some counties and not in others, potentially. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the first step for the pro bono allocation is they need to show substantial numbers of uh, recruited uh, volunteer time. So they need uh, a minimum of 30 attorneys or 5% of the attorneys in the county where they're applying or a thousand hours of donated time. Um, if an organization doesn't meet one of those threshold requirements, they are generally considered ineligible for the allocation. Um, if they can demonstrate that they've met one of those requirements, then they would move on to um, one of three tests uh, to qualify for the allocation. We refer to them as tests A, B, and C. So test A is just demonstrating that they have more volunteer attorney time in the past year than their staff attorney time. Um, it's kind of just a straight line calculation or comparison. Um, test B, if they don't qualify under test A, is also a quantitative test, and they would need to show that more volunteer time than staff time um, in terms of the hours comparison, and that among that volunteer time, it's the volunteer attorney time is more than staff time, uh, more than half of staff time, I should say. Uh, if an organization doesn't meet that test, then they would move on to a narrative explanation where they are able to describe in greater detail how it is they believe that their primary mode of service delivery is through pro, pro bonos. Um, so the eligibility and budget review committee uh, looks at these test C narratives and discusses them to determine whether to make a recommendation about uh, the organization is eligible or not. Tests A and B are considered presumed eligible if they're able to meet those numbers. So for this application cycle, we received 18 applicants um, seeking the pro bono allocation. Uh, seven of those applicants were able to qualify under tests A and or B, um, and you can see the list of those applicants at the bottom of the screen. Um, and then there were 11 organizations that um, submitted narratives under test C, which went through eligibility and budget review. Um, after discussing the test C applicants, uh, the eligibility and budget review committee recommended all of them as eligible for the pro bono allocation next year. Um, with the exception of Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino in Riverside County. So this organization is seeking an allocation in both San Bernardino County and Riverside County. Um, they were able to meet that substantial numbers test in San Bernardino, but not in Riverside. Um, and it's for that reason that they are being recommended as ineligible only in Riverside County. So they would receive the allocation in San Bernardino, but not in Riverside um, for the coming year. Um, but with the exception of Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino, um, the committee felt after reviewing the explanations that um, the rest of the list should be uh, found eligible for the allocation. So um, on the screen is a proposed resolution for the organizations that should be found eligible. And then it was difficult to fit it all on one screen. I'm not sure if you'd like to take it as two separate motions or one motion, but um, sort of the second half of that is finding San Bernardino ineligible in Riverside. Well, let's do it as two separate motions since it may be a significant impact on LASB. Uh, but I, I, Erica, can you help me understand uh, the, the size of the, these pro bono grants? I remember making a presentation at the State Bar where some counties receive pennies. Uh, mm -hmm. How how is the how does the formula work and what's the approximate size of these uh, distributions? Yes, so the formula in general is based on a pro rata um, calculation of the individuals who would be considered indigent under the statute in every county. So you you have the total population of indigent persons in California, and then um, the total amount of IOLTAR EAF funding is then divided by the 58 counties, depending on their proportion of indigent persons who reside in those counties. So that's the first step. And then within any of those individual counties, 10% of that funding is set aside for pro bono programs. Um, so it's difficult to say exactly the size that each organization would get in terms of a grant in an individual county for a few reasons. Um, one is some of these organizations, um, there are a number of them in the same county. So for example, Alliance for Children's Rights, Beth Zedek, Disability Rights Legal Center, Harriet Buhai, LACBA, 
um, public council, all of those are in Los Angeles County. So that 10% is then divided among those organizations and it's divided among them based on their uh, qualified expenditures, which, which vary. And the size of their award depends on the proportion of their expenditures in relation to each other. Um, so it's a little bit difficult to come up with a specific dollar amount, but if you are an organization um, in a county that you're the only pro bono organization or one of few, you would see a, a more substantial kind of contribution or elevation of your allocation because that 10% would, a bigger portion of it would be going to your organization. So I would say the bigger counties that have more organizations, they get a smaller bump, but some of these organizations do get um, a significant, significantly higher amount of funding because of it. All right, so we've got a motion to approve these grants. We'll have a second uh, resolution with respect to one that we are rejecting. So I call for a motion from uh, a commissioner, please. So moved. Tammy, second. I'll second. Jim seconds. Let's do a roll call. Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schraber? Yes. Vanarelli? Yes. Oglagi? Osaroff? Yes. Ball? Fightmaster? Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Boschelli? Yes. Connors? Oh, you're here. Hi, Will. Hey, it's been a uh, rough day. My daughter is sick, so oh. I'm running back and forth uh, between the computer and here, but I'm, I'm here now. Thank you for your patience. Welcome. Connolly? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes, abstain as to bed setting. Judge Klein? Yes. Cruz? Lee? Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes, abstain as to public law center. Motion passes. Thank you. Second uh, resolution, please. This is a resolution with respect to a QLSP we've had some difficulties with in the past. They have new leadership um, after some considerable uh, effort on the part of commissioners who worked hard to help LASB get back on its feet. Uh, and I'm pleased to see that they're doing well. Uh, this came as a bit of a surprise, but um, the recommendation is that they be deemed, uh, found ineligible for their pro bono allocation only as to Riverside County, not as to San Bernardino. Do I hear a motion? I move. Professor Meeker moves. So do I have a second? I'll second. Erica seconds. Uh, roll call, please. Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Schreiber? Chris, are you still on? Vanarelli? Yes. Sorry, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Vanarelli, that was yes. Aglagi Alsaraf? Yes. Ball, yes. Fightmaster, yes. Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Bushelli? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. Judge Klein? Yes. Cruz, Lee, Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Motion passes. All right. Um, we have um, sort of a procedural matter at 5E. And uh, Danielle? Yes, I can lead on that. Yes, of course, I can share my screen. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Danielle McRae. I'm a senior program analyst in the Office of Access and Inclusion. And I am here to chat with you about um, approving the timeline and delegations of authority for a new consumer debt legal assistance um, grant opportunity that we'll have um, upcoming. So I'll first provide some background and then we'll jump right into the recommended timelines and um, roles and delegations of authority. And then I will of course have a resolution for your consideration. 
So first, the Budget Act of 2022 that was signed earlier this summer allocates 15 million in equal access funding for grants to qualified legal services projects and support centers to provide civil legal services for indigent persons related to consumer debt matters affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is a new um, tranche of funding or funding stream um, grant opportunity um, implemented in the Budget Act of 2022. Of that 15 million, 2.5% is available for administrative costs of the Judicial Council and State Bar. And then some of the grant parameters that are also outlined in the Budget Act of 2022. Uh, this funding is to be allocated through a competitive grant process. So there is not a formula grant component, just competitive RFP process. The funds um, may not supplant existing resources, which is language that we've seen um, in previous homelessness prevention grants, for example. Um, they can't use this funding to um, substitute or cover an existing program and then use that funding that they're currently using on the program somewhere else. So they need to essentially um, create a new program or expand an existing program such that they will serve uh, folks that they would not otherwise be able to serve. The Budget Act language also requires that preference be given to QLSPs and support centers that serve rural or underserved communities. And this funding is available uh, through the end of 2025. So um, we're recommending or anticipating this be a one-time three-year grant opportunity um, that would start January 1 of next year and then run through the end of 2025. So to get us to that January 1 start date, this is the proposed um, timeline, grant making timeline, um, and built into it is the different roles that we would recommend the um, committee commission staff uh, play in that process. So earlier this month, the executive committee, I should mention um, the memo makes this clear, but my PowerPoint did not yet, that because this is a one-time grant opportunity, um, it's being recommended that this go through the executive committee. Uh, so the executive committee met earlier this month to recommend, discuss and recommend this timeline and delegations of authority. Um, today we're here to um, put in front of you for consideration the timeline and delegation. The executive committee has a meeting scheduled for September 1 at which they would approve the RFP, including the scoring rubric, um, if the commission so chooses to delegate that authority to the committee. Um, that would set us up for a September 12 grant application release on Smart Simple. And then we would afford about five weeks uh, for programs to get those applications in. They would be due on October 14th. Then the, um, the next five week chunk would be uh, for a commissioner and staff team to score those applications. Uh, and then the uh, recommendations from that scoring team would go back to the executive committee on or about November 30 to recommend grant awards and award amounts to the commission um, at a to be scheduled December commission meeting for approval. Um, again, that gets us up to the January 1 start date. So we would spend the last couple of weeks of December um, getting grant agreements signed, finalizing budget approvals uh, and so forth. So I can pause here for questions um, about the grant opportunity generally or this timeline because uh, the next slide is just the resolution. Yeah. Catherine has her hand up. Can you uh, just say a little bit more about the composition of the commissioner's staff team who scores the applications? Sure, absolutely. So I believe the plan would be for the September 1 executive committee meeting to ultimately make that decision of how many commissioners it would be versus how many staff members it would be. Um, for the Cal HFA grant opportunity that also ran through the executive committee or went through the executive committee. Um, that was two commissioners and three staff members, um, which seemed to work well um, in, in my opinion, but I think that that would be a decision that would be made at that September 1 
um, meeting by the executive committee if and the commission so choose. Of course. Just to elaborate. Um, so yeah, the staff recommendations, I'm going to tweak that a little bit. Um, I know that um, the HP committees, uh, they're going to have a, a commissioner staff led team and it'll be um, equal amounts of staff and equal amount of commissioners. And that will be the recommendation from staff for the executive committee. The, the, the one caveat is the executive committee is very small. Um, so one potential outcome could be um, commissioners not, not comprised of executive um, committee members. It may, may be opening up to a larger um, uh, the committee. And I believe that's what happened last time. However, there wasn't anybody that volunteered from um, the, the larger commission. And so um, two uh, executive committee members um, stepped up to do the Cal PHA scoring, um, but, but it may go in that direction. So it's Catherine, I, that's what I recollected, and I just I want to encourage the opportunity for other people to participate just as a way of having greater full commission involvement. So thank you for that, Juan. Thank you, Catherine. It's also going to give uh, commissioners who've had no experience using these rubrics uh, a, a very good opportunity to understand how they work, how the scoring is done by staff and by commissioners. So it's a great opportunity to learn the functioning, and I'd encourage any commissioner who hasn't done that to join. Thank you, Catherine. Eric and then Jim uh, have their hands up. So I'm I'm wondering what consumer debt is in, in this context and how this is any different from what, what um, QLSPs are already doing. I mean, if we have extra money, obviously we, we should award it. We should do what we are recommending. I don't really have any objection to what you're proposing, but I just wonder about the wisdom of the legislature kind of just an observation kind of coming up with these kind of subject specific grants as opposed to just increasing the EAF funding generally. Just, just wondering about Yeah, and I can speak to that because of that. course, because we've had conversations with the legislature on this and actually the staff proposed um, working with the commissioner, um, the language behind the legislation. Um, so the idea is it, it, uh, to have dedicated funding. And, and we've heard this from, from programs. It, it, this didn't come from a state bar recommendation, but it came from um, programs in conjunction with LAC and obviously the state bar um, supported it. Um, but it is like what you say, Eric, um, really kind of traditional uh, consumer debt legal assistance work that um, our programs are undertaking right now. Um, and is being funded with IOLT and EF funding. But the idea behind it is that um, if there's a dedicated pot, then um, programs could start up or expand um, and hire staff. And so the, and the, the, the you know, 15 million over uh, five, uh, um, sorry, 15 million over three years is meant to allow um, programs to hire at least one or two additional staff. Now, I, I would say one of the beauties of IOLT money is that it's not earmarked. This funding is earmarked. Right. So it has to be used specifically for this purpose. Uh, Jim and then Catherine. Yeah, I was just wondering if the legislature gave any elaboration on what an underserved community is. I mean, by one definition, all the eligible clients are underserved. By uh, my experience on the homeless prevention grants is that some programs are very specific, like uh, uh, elderly veterans who are homeless as opposed to underserved communities. And is this going to just be left up to the committee or the committee in terms of its scoring rubric, or do we have any standardization at all for the commission? So we do this statutory language or the budget language does not provide um, any more detail than rural or underserved. Um, we are envisioning um, staff are envisioning and, and will of course defer to the executive committee and homelessness um, prevention committee on this, but we are hoping to where possible. Um, use consistent definitions for if that definition of what um, underserved communities is becomes a little more narrower um, with the homelessness prevention um, four grants that we'll talk about a little later today. Um, we would ideally like to mirror that in this grant process as well. It's uh, easier for the programs if we're using a consistent definition. It's easier for staff um, committee members and the commission if we're using a consistent definition, but that definition has not been statutorily defined. I think that's up to the uh, committees, the relevant committees to define for themselves. Well, if, if I could just suggest after this round of uh, grant uh, decisions or allocations that maybe we could look at each of the different uh, committees in terms of their scoring rubric to see how they define that, how they've used it, what the pros and cons are for different approaches, just so that next year we'll have more of a standardization, both for the grantees as well as for our Mm -hmm. scoring committees. Yes, absolutely. And and Chris, 
McConkey and I um, have been working closely hand in hand as we start gearing up for this grant opportunity and the HP4 um, to you know, try to do what we can um, to streamline those two processes, given that there's not a kind of more formal um, streamlined definition across the committees yet. Catherine, then Bonnie. I'll just say very briefly, I think the legislature was interested in and was provided information about the economic impact of COVID on particularly low wage workers and medical debt and other kinds of debt they incurred. And this is an opportunity to have a, a more focus on that and to be able to provide information about the positive outcomes that were achieved. Bonnie. Um, I agree. And I think one of the other things, at least in discussions, is a category that what that the committee may want to consider um, as an area that is underserved are um, people who are undocumented. Um, since in many parts of the state, uh, if it's the funding is primarily uh, it, the services are offered by legal services organizations, that is a particular challenge. So that might be one of the things to consider um, in terms of that um, underserved category. Thank you. And Danielle, thank you for this beautiful presentation. Of course. Uh, we. Uh, have a resolution? Yes. Uh, so I can read this aloud, but it is the same um, as in the memo provided. Um, if the commission agrees with the executive committee's proposal, passage of the following resolution is recommended. Resolved that the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission recommends the timeline for 2023-2025 consumer debt grants as presented in the executive committee's August 12, 2022 memo. And it is further resolved that the commission delegate authority to the executive committee to approve the request for proposals, including scoring rubric for the consumer debt grants and to a cons uh, commissioner staff team to score applications in consultation with the committee. Do I have a motion? Oh, Catherine? I just, I, I, I may have misunderstood the timeline, but I thought this ultimately went back to the full commission. And this sounds like, the executive committee is going to approve. Are they approving the? No, there. There's a commission meeting at the bottom of the calendar. Uh, Want to yeah. roll that? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, that's what I was referring to in December. I was just looking at the resolution, and it doesn't reference a, that it's approved by the full commission. So oh, wow. when I read the approve the request for proposals, like, I guess I was maybe wrongly interpreting that to be like they're going to make the approval of that. Oh, I see what you're saying. You know, that, that is a fair point um, because Catherine, I think when we drafted it, um, the status quo is that the commission approve it. So if it was, we would have been more explicit, but, but I see how that, that, that could be confusing. Maybe you could add for ultimate approval by the commission at its December meeting or something like yeah. that. That'd so, be great. Thank you. I just want to be clear that we're talking about the same things. So when we say approve the request for proposals, that's the actual RFP document. Um, which would not be going back to the commission mm -hmm. for approval. Um, and then the second delegation here is to a commissioner staff team to score applications in consultation with the committee. Um, however, what language would we like to add to make it explicitly clear that the ultimate grant awards would be going back to the commission for approval? Because Any neither, yeah. Your suggestion was for ultimate approval by the commission at its September meeting. And I was gonna suggest Sorry, I don't have a hand feature on this funky computer I'm using, but uh, I was going to suggest that we look back um, at the Cal HFA language and see if we had that in there so we might have consistency in the resolution. But if that's uh, too time consuming, I mean, it's essentially the same type. Of, it's the same procedure that became kind of the model for these small grants, I believe. So for Cal HFA, that actually did not go back to the full commission for grant approval, the committee approved the grant awards and then they were reported back to the commission, but the commission did not vote on the final grant approval of grant amounts for Cal HFA, if I recall. Okay, and here we're saying there is going to be, it's, okay. But I, I, I see uh, two hands up, Erica and then Ami. Yeah, all I was gonna suggest was for the language is to say something along the lines of like, um, to score applications in consultation with the committee uh, 
to provide recommendations for ultimate approval, just because that's what we do with all the other yes. committees. Yes, and this is admittedly a little wordy. So if commas need to be added or moved to make it clear, I am open to um, that level of edits as well. I mean, I, I just want to make sure that I'm clear. In the first part of this, though, we're, we're recommending the timeline. That's the timeline that includes the commission approval. Yes. Already, right? So do we need to add additional? I mean, it sort of it seems duplicative if that's already a part of what we're recommending in the initial resolution. So maybe that's, maybe we can put that back up just so everybody's sort of clear that that's a part of what we're adopting in this resolution. Like, so yeah, the, the, I, I think that's right, but it goes through the steps and what the committee's delegated to do, even though it's reflected in the chart and there wasn't a mention of who was ultimately approving it. So like we're just approving uh, it, right? Yeah. So. It that, does that, say that was my thinking. It does say commission approves, I believe. Can you go back to that? The, yeah, the it does. does, but I think Catherine is mentioning that the resolution mm -hmm. language did not, and she would feel more comfortable. I don't want to speak for Catherine, but I believe she'd feel more comfortable if that was explicit in the resolution language. And I, I think there's not a problem with making it more explicit, and I think that's when we were drafting it because we had the activity and it was status quo. We didn't explicitly make it, but I don't think it's. I don't think it hurts to clarify now if there's a question mark. Uh, Eric, Eric had proposed the language. I, I was thinking that in place of the word ultimate, I would use final. Sure. Would it be helpful if I read the resolution again? Thank you. Resolve that the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission <laughs> recommends the timeline for 2023-2025 consumer debt grants as presented in the Executive Committee's August 12, 2022 memo. And it is further resolved that the commission delegate authority to the executive committee to approve the request for proposals, including scoring rubric for the consumer debt grants and to a commissioner staff team to score applications in consultation with the committee to provide recommendations for final approval by the commission. It's, fu it's, it's uh, funding recommendations, right? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, uh, Erica. Sorry, I have one more random question, and I'm sorry if I just missed this. But um, for the first part of it, I'm just this is just confusion. Who are we recommending the timeline to? Yes, that I think is just a holdover from um, the executive committee. Oh, okay, Apologies. okay. So it is us approving the timeline. Yes. So the yes. Got I'm it. sorry. Okay. That was my mistake. The commission no, is approving no, no, the fine. timeline and also the delegations of authority. No, that's a great catch. No, it's fine. I was just like, oh, are we just is it guidance? Anyway, um, thank you. No, thank you. All right, we had a motion. Um, I'd like to have a renewed motion on the revised resolution, please. I'll make the motion. Erica makes the motion. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Kim seconds, and let's do roll call. Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Vanarelli? Yes. Oglagi? Alsaroff? Yes. Ball? Fightmaster? Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Boschelli? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. <clears throat> Judge Klein? Yes. Cruz? Lee? Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Motion passes. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, we now move on to the Rules Committee and item 5F. And I turn it over to Amin and Erica and others. Can I jump in for one second? Um, this is a very heavy, weighty, long, detailed, complex <laughs> discussion, which comes up from a lot of work. And I just open it up to whether or not people want a five minute break before we jump in on this. It's, it's just a lot. I'm, I'm fine with continuing. I just want to throw that out in advance. Anybody? 
You don't have to uh, use the uh, hand function. You can just raise your hand. We can see you on the screen. People want to take a bio break? break? It, yeah, clear your head, get some cold water. Uh, yes, I, no? Looks like we're, we're going to plow through it. OK, OK. I, I, I saw a few hands. I don't know if that, did, if that missed you guys. I'm for a five minute break. Yeah, okay. I, I will. I will right. yield five minutes of my <laughs> of my time. So we can take a break. Good for you, Chris. All right, five minute Jonathan. break. Okay, five, five minutes. Minute yeah, we'll be back at uh, what one forty-five. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So one forty-five. Let us resume on item 5F, the Rules Committee, and I'll turn it over to Amin. Thanks, Rich. And, and the presentations are gonna be made by people far more capable than I am, but I, I wanna preface the discussion um, and, and the presentation by saying that these issues that are gonna be presented to, to the commission today some of them are procedural. Some of them go to the heart of the work that the commission does and the funding that's um, funneled through the commission to the community. Uh, a lot of uh, analysis, thought, an incredible amount of legwork and community consultation has gone into uh, all of these. So I, I wanna first and foremost, before getting into this, thank the staff for all the work that they put into this, an incredible amount, thanks to LAC as well, who is very active in this process, um, and to the commissioners who served as working group members for each of these issues. Uh, like I said, a lot, of, a, lot of thought, a lot of thoughtful debate, a lot of thoughtful analysis. Um, and so these issues are coming before the commission now after having gone through a uh, very rigorous and robust uh, process. So just wanted to throw that out there and I'm gonna turn it over to Chris who uh, spearheaded this issue, this next issue that we're gonna be addressing. Thank you, Amin. Uh, I echo all those thanks. Um, and uh, please uh, do, do not be shy about moving this particular topic along because it's it's like so important and so academically and, and in practice interesting that I think everyone will want to like ask about and and, um, and engage with like almost every single thing and then we have you know but we want to get to other things too so so stop me from letting it go too long and thank you in advance for that so uh, for the rules committee's proposed definitions of the word civil and the phrase legal services as those words appear in the IOLTA statute. I have a few slides uh, to just cover quickly the stakeholder inclusive process that Amin just alluded to. Um, the proposed definitions, I, I've attempted to sort of paraphrase the case for them that it, that's in the 19 page memo in like one slide each. And then we have the resolutions. So to lay a foundation um, from, this is just from the background section of the memo, this is a very important phrase, civil legal services. Um, it's important for at least three core pillar-esque, hold up the whole IOLTA funding scheme um, um, uh, ways. So one is the phrase civil legal services governs who is eligible for IOLTA uh, and, and by extension EAF funding and, and by extension the homelessness prevention grants and other grants. Um, so as an example, it is in the definition of qualified legal services project and civil legal services appears in the statutory definition of qualified support center. So for instance, QLSP means a nonprofit project that provides as its primary purpose and function, civil legal services, dot, dot, dot. It goes, that's one pillar. The next pillar is what if you, once you are found eligible, what can you do with the funding? Um, so what work qualifies? Uh, so for instance, the state bar shall distribute all monies received in the program for the provision of civil legal services, dot, dot, dot. And then the third big pillar is how much funding do you get if you're a QLSP? So the support centers obviously have their unique funding formula, but the, um, for the QLSPs, if, you, if more than one QLSP serves the same county, uh, you look at each QLSP's uh, county level share of, of um, 
uh, qualifying civil legal services in the previous fiscal year. Um, so, so do you qualify? What can you spend the dollars on and how many dollars do you get if you're a QLSP? Uh, the, the fourth thing I wanted this is not a pillar that kind of holds up the whole thing, but it's really important from the statute. Uh, the legislature did add effective January 1st of this year, um, a definition for civil legal services in the statute so that that term was did not have a definition in section 6213 um, before and it reads it's, it's the entire definition more or less civil legal services includes legal services related to oh the dot 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 is and like in addition to matters considered traditionally considered civil legal services related to expungements record sealing or clearance proceedings not requiring a finding of factual innocence and infractions all right so the state bar uh rules for the legal services trust fund program do have uh, an existing definition for legal services it's quite pithy it's just legal services includes all professional services provided by a licensee of the state bar and similar complementary services of a law student paralegal under the supervision and control of a licensee of the bar in accordance with law and civil is undefined so very short definition for legal services no definition for civil so the rules committee engaged um, in a very uh, legal services stakeholder inclusive process. Um, it, it did its own research. It looked at the definition um, of legal work, the closest term to legal services, and the American Bar Association's most recent, so this is 2021 standards for the provision of civil legal aid, and modeled the proposed definition quite closely on the ABA's definition of legal work in the standards. Um, and it um, uh, had staff convene four focus groups of mostly legal service, current legal services grantees. Um, the memo kind of details how those focus groups were composed. Um, um, and then after that sort of initial uh, um, engagement with stakeholders, the, rule, the uh, working group of the rules committee circulated its memo to the whole legal services community via LAC um, for about three to four weeks. LAC um, uh, collected feedback from its members and met with its members and then submitted a letter um, in support of the definition of legal services. Um, after carefully reviewing uh, the working group's memo and the, the community's feedback, the Rules Committee approved the definition of legal services that you saw in the memo, and it approved a de definition of civil in concept. Um, and, and let the rules committee and staff do, make technical edits to that definition as it appeared in the memo that was posted for today. Um, but, but technically their resolution was approving the definition of civil and concept. Um, key, few key takeaways from the focus groups and then I'm just gonna jump right into the definitions, but this is, this is really core to like how we ended up where we are. Um, these were areas of major agreement among the legal aid uh, support center and QSP community. Um, from what, what staff heard in the focus groups. The current definition of legal services, that one that emphasizes licensure and, and all the people that licensees control, um, its focus on licensees, law students, and paralegals is too exclusive. It's very detached from legal aid, the actual spectrum of interventions that legal aid programs that support centers QSPs, the work they do, that they, the ILTA statute funds, and that all the different professionals that work there. So that was a major area of consensus from the community. Um, another area of agreement was that the definition should have a revised definition should have at its core the legal rights of low income people. It should it should mention those rights and that should be sort of the heart of the definition. A lot of enthusiasm for that approach. Um, it is, after all, the work of legal and sports centers to create events and defend those rights. Um, if the definition, there's much agreement around this, if the proposed definition of civil or legal services is too broad, organizations that you don't traditionally think of as legal aid providers and who might not even think of themselves as legal aid providers or legal services support centers might suddenly qualify like the door was open too far um, and, it, and it related to that the revised definition needs to agree with um, to the best of everyone's good faith knowledge the legislature's intention and in the statute and then finally there should continue to be room for complementary services like those of social workers, at least when they advance traditional legal aid cases. So the definition, this is the big takeaways for the, the proposed definition of legal services in the memo. It seeks to capture the definition in practice. This is not an attempt to completely devise a brand new concept of legal services, but rather to capture sort of what the commission has been authorizing to date uh, more or less, and to clarify the ambiguities around things like policy advocacy um, and social workers, um, to make those things explicit and, and draw the boundaries more clearly. 
It's grounded in the legal rights of indigent clients. That's responsive to the community's feedback. And staff in the working group uh, love that, that idea. Um, it incorporates many elements from the um, and the overarching strategy from the ABA's definition of legal work. It categorizes legal services in three ways uh, as legal representation. Think of it as three buckets, legal representation, which the current definition kind of gets at, non-representational services, which the ABA's definition included and the working group and the community liked that. And then a third bucket called complementary services, which is actually in the current um, um, definition, but it's just kind of a passing reference. And that's where we, that's where we uh, classify things like social worker services. It requires attorneys to perform or supervise representation and non-representation services, the first two buckets. And it requires attorneys to direct complementary services. That's the third bucket. The memo goes into the differences, but essentially it boils down to um, if it's, if it's essentially the practice of law, an attorney needs to be supervising or performing it. Uh, complementary services like those that social workers provide are not necessarily like the practice of law, although they might be critical to the success of a legal aid case and advance a legal outcome in that case. So an attorney may, may not be in the best situation or need to supervise it, but they at least need to be um, directing and be the ultimate like final authority on its inclusion in the legal aid strategy for that case. So I'm not going to, I, I think you've all read the proposed definition. It's on the screen now. It's the first column. All I did is I just broke it up into different, I like, um, I kind of, some, I split a few sentences, but I, I just, if you were to read the first column from top to bottom, it would be that full beautiful paragraph definition. All I did was break it up into rows for the purposes of being able to tell you what each chunk does. So the second column is like, what's the overall purpose of this piece of the definition? Um, so I'm not going to read you the whole definition unless somebody wants to, but uh, wants me to. But what I will say is the top of the definition, the part that says legal services means work that uses legal knowledge and skills to create. And then it goes on about rights and it talks about how it um, encompasses both legal representation and representational services. That, that initial part of the definition seeks to get in most of the, um, the work that legal aid programs and support centers do. It, it, the, the main test is, does it use legal knowledge and skills to dot, 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 right? Create, advance, protect, enforce the legal rights of indigent clients and communities. Everything else below that is either an example that's helps to clarify a, a previous area of ambiguity or uh, um, il illuminate so, uh, complementary services. So I highlighted it in yellow because that, that's where almost everything gets in that should be getting in. The next chunk, its purpose in the definition is to provide clear, crisp examples. The current definition of legal services doesn't provide any examples. The ABA's definition of legal work provided lots. And that was, it was much popularity around the idea of being really clear and providing a non-exhaustive list of examples. And it does actually uh, clarify things like direct policy advocacy has been in, it means to stay in and that sort of thing. The third row clarifies the attorney's role in representation and non-representational services. Th th those are like the practice of law, um, 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 more or less practice of law situations, but some non-practice of law, like um, know your rights trainings, you know, legal in, um, um, information, um, maybe some non-representational services like pro per clinic at, um, um, services, but it, it's where we want an attorney to be um, uh, performing or supervising the work. And then the bottom uh, chunk of the definition, those last two rows, deal with complementary services. So that the, we could have, and I think maybe the ABA's definition even, even did this. ABA is really enthusiastic about including social workers, but I think they, they even didn't go the extra mile in their definition of legal work. Um, um, we, we tried to go the extra mile and be really clear that social workers um, that um, are uh, advancing legal outcomes in underlying legal aid cases will continue to be providing legal services because that, that's what the commission has been finding. Um, and it, it illuminates, uh, this used to just kind of be the practice, but it wasn't really in writing when that happens. Great, I, I should be turning it over to questions and I see Jason raised his hand. Uh, yeah, thanks Chris. Can you uh, clarify or further extrapolate on the historical precedents for legal services, including direct lobbying as an included service profile? Yeah, so the, the well, the precedent in the uh, legal services trust fund program is just that the commission has been finding 
that it is um, that direct policy advocacy from a grantee towards um, the legislature, you know, federal, state legislature, or or our local government um, is a legal service. And the the way the proposed definition would do that is it would keep that in as the use of legal knowledge and skills to do that work. So in that sense, the proposed definition seeks to um, continue the commission's practice of allowing it. So Chris, if, if you don't mind, um, just to address Jason's question, I know in the eligibility review commission committee, we do these ILAW reports, which does like impact litigation and advocacy work. And so examples of that would be, and we have approved those as like qualified expenditures in several instances in the past. Examples include where um, particular organizations will advocate on behalf of indigent clients for legislation that's coming through. So we have actually approved in those instances direct lobbying. Um, on, as, but we have sort of distinguished to the extent that it is like legal services and primarily for indigent clients. So hopefully that does that provide you with kind of the precedence that you're had a question about? It provides me with clarity as to what has historically been done. Yeah, well, the, the IOLTA statute doesn't say um, yes or no to it. It just says the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission, go ahead and interpret legal services. What do you, what is it, you know, decide what it means. And then at, to my knowledge, the commission has counted direct policy advocacy, helping the legislature draft a bill, for instance, that will expand the civil rights of low-income communities has, has been, it's been the commission's practice to allow that for a very, very long time. Yeah, what, one example we've done is like, uh, that I remember is like public advocates, they do a fair amount of lobbying on behalf of like educational, like resources, um, and show that those resources generally um, address primarily indigent students in California public schools. And so we have generally considered that a kind of a, a, a advocacy work that's not necessarily representational. Keep in mind also, you know, this is IOLTA funding from the state of California, distinguishable from federal legal services corporation funding. Mm -hmm. the, and, and, oh, I'm so sorry, Kim. I thought you were talking. Go, go ahead. No, I was just saying, which does not permit uh, that kind of advocacy. In um, and policy advocacy is. is uh, uh, there, there's 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 like lobbying towards the legislature on legislation that would um, uh, sort of improve the civil legal rights of indigent communities, but it's also inclusive of administrative rulemaking. So if um, a grantee needed to go before federal or state agency that's interpreting the law and it's it's passing rules that could harm in in a civil legal way harm low income communities, it can like do public comments and advocacy letters and. Um, and testify before those bodies, and that would be policy advocacy. Corey. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, um, I was going to say something about rulemaking as well, which was just that um, there's a lot that goes on in, in, in that realm in terms of policy, um, which isn't necessarily thought of as lobbying in the traditional sense, but it's, um, and an example of that would be in, in unemployment, um, attempting to get regulations passed that ease people's access to unemployment benefits. That's been a, a, an issue. Uh, question. <clears throat> Are there any limitations of state law on advocacy on, for indigents on reproductive rights? Are there any um, um, limit under like state, state statute? Law, Are there any law, limitations? I think you can't because it's obviously going to be a hotbed after Dobbs or further uh, litigation. No. Involving indigents, are, are our um, grantees allowed to do that? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, as far as it's, it, it implicates their civil, yeah, civil rights. Yes, uh, it it would have to. Um, so so you know, du Duan, if I don't get this quite right, feel free to to clarify. But um, for a grantee to use IOLTA EAF dollars on that kind of policy, they would have to be able to show that it was of special or like disproportionate 
importance to low income communities, to indigent communities. So sometimes when there's a public policy like that, that kind of affects people of all income levels, they might have to produce data, uh, reliable data that shows that that public policy is particularly harmful to low income communities. That may be a situation where they could do that. Yeah, and that, that topic of indigency is, is going to go um, right after this, so. Yeah, I'm going to suggest that we move on. I mean, like, again, I can't see if there are any hands up for comment, but I'm going to suggest, given the weight of what we've got to get through, I'm going to suggest we move on. Okay, I'll defer it to Kim, and then I, we'll, we'll I just have, had, yeah. Go ahead, Will. I, I guess I just had one observation that I wanted to put on the record very quickly. Um, I really support the spirit of these changes on the complementary services piece, especially with um, mental health or social services, I am a little concerned that we may be putting people in a position where they get help as long as they're pursuing whatever legal outcome, whether it's a TRO or some domestic violence assistance, and then suddenly find it be cut off. Now, my understanding is this, most programs wouldn't do that, they would, included as part of a comprehensive um, package, but I'm not sure that the rule references that. And I would be concerned about the overall health of the individual long-term if an overzealous uh, legal aid agency was giving the service just to get to the end outcome, but not make sure that the individual was fully cared for. I don't know how to address that, but I, I wanted to raise it and get it on the record. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you, your Will. comment. Yeah, and, and just so everyone knows where I think Will, the, the part Will was talking about is the second to bottom row. Uh, so for complementary services, they can be legal services provided that they advance a legal outcome, serves an integral part of an attorney's legal strategy. So, so that Will's pointing out, well, okay, well, once the underlying legal aid case ends or goes, or it stops being an integral part of the strategy or, or for any other reason it becomes, uh, that, that link breaks, then suddenly the ongoing complementary service that that client may have been receiving at the legal aid provider would stop being a legal service. So that the org could still provide the service, but they wouldn't be able to use IELTS eight dollars on it. It wouldn't, any subsequent spending on that work wouldn't count towards their eligibility next year. The, the rules committee um, talks about it a little bit and, and sort of the, the strategy question that came up was, um, well, if the underlying legal aid case gives way, let's say the case comes to an end, this activity that might not otherwise be considered a legal service, like it's, it's um, the thing that gave it its legal services nature has ended. So would it continue kind of like from inertia to be a legal service? And the rules committee and the working group said it, they think it should be a break. Um, but Will's point is like that could harm a client. So that's, that was the public policy kind of discussion. As a matter of timing, oh, great. The, as a matter of timing uh, and um, ABA, ABA and uh, state bar rules, uh, representation would not be terminated, could not be terminated. Uh, this only has an impact on coming year. The, the legal services that would be, that would have been theoretically under Will's question, uh, somehow interrupted, could not be interrupted without a violation of state uh, bar ethics rules. Thank you, Rich. Um, okay, so. Well, if Kim's asked that we move on to. I was gonna say, like, sorry. So Kim, and here we go. To civil, this, one, this one's a, it's a shorter definition. There's fewer things to think about. Um, so there's no current written definition of state bar rules for the trust fund program. So there's nothing to compare it to. Um, I will just sort of say as a matter of practice, grantees, uh, applicants, grantees, commissioners and staff have found the distinction between civil and criminal to be a little, e like to be mostly straightforward to navigate over time. So it hasn't necessarily suffered greatly by not having a written definition, but there, but there is kind of a fuzzy line. So it, it would benefit from having a rule or a definition. And so um, the one that the rules committee has proposed um, proposes to continue the current practice of including all legal issues that arise under civil law um, and to exclude criminal defense work. This is, um, this has been the, the, norm, um, other, of course, than the work that Section 6213 um, of, the, of the IOLTA statute now expressly 
uh, defines as civil, and that is, um, it's in the next, on the next slide, but that's essentially the expungements, infractions, record sealing, claims proceedings, not requiring factual finding of innocence. Wait, wait, wait a second. Those are all in a criminal court. I mean, I, I used to hear those all the time. Why? I mean, all criminal convictions, even a traffic ticket has implications for insurance. That's a criminal proceeding. Why would we uh, have an exception for that? Uh, record sealing, first of all, the public defenders could handle it yeah it's um so it, it well the legislature added it to the the business professions code as, as it defined it as so, i mean yes it's oh, probably right. like arises under the penal code and it's like but they the legislature like carved it out as like but we do want these dollars to pay for this and then it, i think the public policy one of the public policy reasons that the legislature did that was um because it was so interconnected with other civil legal aid issues no, i understand the policy yeah. proceedings it is a criminal proceeding they do take place in the yeah. court and, and uh, it's just for me it's a strange exception yeah, uh, yeah exactly and then the legislature, yeah exactly the legislature kind of like decided to to accept it oh all right yeah so i did the same thing for you here just broke it up into three chunks to try and be able to communicate clearly what the function of each chunk is so the first sentence again is sort of the just the like the main way you get in it's, it's a little it's a little vague it's challenging to define it's easier to define criminal than it is civil because you've criminal right like um uh we were just talking about you can refer to things like the penal code but essentially refers to any legal issues questions or process that arise under any body of civil law the rules committee and the working group um, especially the working group because the rules committee did let the working group go back and make technical edits to its definition and concept. So this, this is really coming from the working group for this meeting. The second, the second row here, um, they, they, um, we really wanted to make sure that we captured an explicit provision that um, that's in the statute that we can't do away with it. And then, you know, like we wanted to capture it like uh, as written because it, because it is operative here. And that's section 6223B's prohibition on the use of these funds for quote, the provi this is it, it, this is more or less verbatim from the statute. The provision of legal assistance with respect to criminal proceedings. I think it says any criminal proceeding. And then the, it's that same section goes on to say proceedings concerning expungements, record sealing, or clearance proceedings not requiring factual innocence infractions are not criminal proceedings. Like it, is it like for the purposes of this funding, it's not defined that way. Um, so that's more or less a quote from the statute. We wanted to put it in there. It's it's operative here. Um, the um, the opportunity that the commission has and the rule committee and the working group are recommending um, is to further interpret um, and and clarify um, what is the provisional legal assistance with respect to a criminal proceeding and in, in at least one way. So we received one pub written public comment on the definition of civil, and it was it was from a. Um, support center called the Disability Rights Education Defense Fund, they, they made a really good point. They're like, you know, if you're not careful here, some work that's traditionally considered civil that might arise in a criminal proceeding or be construed as, quote, with respect to criminal proceeding, like language, like uh, act, public access work, language, disability accommodations work that might arise in the context of a criminal proceeding, but isn't an attempt to provide criminal defense legal representation could fall out if we're, if we're not careful about saying that, well, that civil work is still civil. It's not going to be construed as the provision of legal assistance with respect to criminal proceedings. So the, the working group does recommend this last um, long sentence, this bottom row, that clarifies that these, quote, collateral civil issues, and then gives specific examples to make it clear what they're talking about, um, uh, are not criminal, provided that the civil, so the examples are public access, disability accommodations, language access that arise during criminal proceedings are not, and then this is a reference to the prohibition in 6223B, are not legal assistance with respect to criminal proceedings, kind of quote, end quote, provided the, the civil services do not directly affect the determination of guilt, sentencing, or other disposition. The rules, the, the working group really went back and forth on like just how to word this, um, but it, it's placing some weight on the, um, the adverb directly. The, the idea is it's like, well, increasing, you know, ensuring that a uh, criminal defendant's like civil disability rights are um, are enforced um, might have an indirect or like down the chain of events consequence for like the outcome of their case. But it's not directly, you know, it's on the on the merits of their criminal case 
or or um, or uh, directly de um, affecting their determination of guilt or sen sentencing, as would pure criminal defense legal representation. Um, Chris, we're going to let you move through this. We know we've got mm. two more major areas, and so that's it. My next slide's the resolution. Okay, great. So I'm going to I'm going to defer to you on timing. Uh, how, okay. how long to continue um, discussion that is, um, but the next slide is the vote. So I think we're ready to move to that, unless okay. there's any burning questions. The presentation's been terrific. And we're just assuming, Rich and I assume that every commissioner reads everything that's sent to them. And certainly the work on these memos was just terrific. Um, a lot of reading, but I think that should help move this along. Thank you. I did notice that Christina had her hand up a moment ago, so I don't know whether she. Had... Oh, I, my question was um, victims' rights matters that are in the criminal court, because there there are a lot. Victims can be represented by counsel and assert all kinds of rights, including restitution. I would consider that civil, but just a thought. It's all right. <laughs> That's great. It, you know those sorts of. Because the working group also and the rules committee were like, well, you know, we can't try as we might think of every possible okay. application. So the the hope in the well, I'll just kind of kick this back to you to see if this um, it helps at all. Is the we the first sentence is deliberately very broad. It's the hope that like those should someone want to make a good faith case that that's civil and should be covered, their argument would probably hang on that like first sentence. Yeah, it would be able to okay. show it arises under civil law. Yeah, okay. and then they're probably going to get it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So Kim, do you want to um, Chris, have a vote? Chris, Chris, you want to just read the resolution and great, and then we'll move forward. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, the resolution is resolved that the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission adopts the definitions of civil and legal services, amending State Bar Rule three point six seven two, as set forth in the Commission Rules Committee's August twelfth, twenty twenty two memo including attachment A. Catherine, uh, I just, I'm, I'm sorry, I just wanted to clarify right before. Um, this um, recommendation is actually going to go to the Board of Trustees. They'll send it out for public comment. It, so it's not okay. literally if you today you vote and it's going to be a rule change. Dewan, did you want me to change um, commission adopts to commission recommends or approves? Um, approves is probably sufficient. It's better. OK, just better reflects like the nature. Um, no, let me reshare my screen. Sorry, too big. Are you ready for a motion now? Jason, Jason Sands. I, uh, I was hoping I could ask a quick clarifying question, um, just because I'm not sure of the corresponding reference rules offhand. Um, does the rule 3.672 uh, remain in the confines of IOLTA funding, like the uh, business and profession code statutes that were referenced as it relates to civil services? That's a great question. Yes, yeah, so 3.672 is a state bar rule for the legal services trust fund program. Um, I actually, let me see with the, um, I'm just pulling up attachment A. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, art, you know, article two construction of certain statutory provisions. Um, and I believe it, it's only interpreting the IOLTA statute. We had a motion. Catherine makes the motion. Thank you. Second. I'll do roll call. Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Fenerelli? Yes. Oglagi? Al Saraf? Yes. Ball? Fightmaster? Bennett? I trust my colleagues. That will be a yes. Thank you. Blakemore? Yes. Bushelli? Abstain. Connolly? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Galkin? 
Abstain. Iskin? Yes. Judge Klein? Yes. Cruz, Lee, Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Motion passes. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And then we have the, the next codification topic is um, the definition of indigency and um, Erica will be presenting on behalf of the, the committee. Thank you. So um, I'll try to move through this fairly quickly. Um, and I will preface this by saying I have spent a lot of time, you know, <laughs> looking at these rules and the memo. So if there's anything I'm going over too quickly, please do feel free to interrupt me and um, ask any questions you may have. Um, so as Juan said, we'll be talking about the recommendations from the Rules Committee about the definition of indigency and um, as well as demonstrating indigency. And this topic is confined to qualified legal services providers, um, which are the organizations that are required to provide free civil legal services to indigent persons. So support centers uh, will be dealt with as a separate topic at a later date. So um, we'll just be focusing on QLSPs today as far as uh, this conversation goes. Um, so when uh, this topic came up, uh, we first identified um, the statutory provisions and other governing authorities that would apply. Um, one of those, the main one being the Business and Professions Code Section 6213D, which provides a definition of indigent person. Um, another code section, 6218, which deals with establishing eligibility guidelines for indigent persons, so for organizations to, um, to screen for services, for eligibility for services, uh, as well as eligibility guidelines for legal services projects, which um, are guidelines that go into greater detail um, about the statute and provide sort of extensive commentary um, about ways for the organizations to, to meet their, their requirements under the statute. And um, the eligibility guidelines pertain more to demonstrating indigency when working on behalf of an organization or a group of persons. So these were kind of our three main focus areas um, uh, because there is no corresponding state bar rule um, for these provisions. There is no rule that kind of further clarifies them at this point. Um, and so that was sort of the project it was to craft a state bar rule that could um, clarify or further expand on the definition of indigent person um, and ways to apply that definition uh, accurately and meaningfully. So. Um, so as I said, the first topic was clarifying the definition under the Business and Professions Code. Um, currently, what section 6213D says is that an indigent person is any of the following. Um, a person whose income is at or below 200% of the federal poverty level. Um, I put an asterisk there because that is a recent statutory change. Um, folks who've been on the commission before know that in prior years it was 125% of the federal poverty level. And the first time that this topic came up, which was actually almost two years ago, um, that was kind of the first step that was taken in terms of making these changes to the definition. Um, and uh, you know, the commission already looked at it isolated to this topic. Um, it went through a subcommittee and then uh, there was a successful statutory change. So um, as of 2022, this is the new income, the standard income threshold is 200% of the federal poverty level. Um, and then there are some other qualifying characteristics for a person to be considered indigent under this definition. Um, so the statute says if you're eligible for supplemental security income, um, if you're eligible for services under the Older Americans Act, uh, or if you are eligible for services under the Developmentally Disabled Assistance Act, um, any person who fits under one of those definitions would be considered indigent and eligible for free services. Um, there is also a pro bono income threshold, which um, historically was uh, significantly different from the, the standard income threshold of 125%. Um, so organizations that receive the pro bono allocation, they could use this, uh, that was the office interpretation was pro bono allocation recipients could use this higher income threshold uh, to provide services. Um, so there was discussion about that, whether it really should be confined to pro bono allocation recipients or any organization that includes pro bono work under their umbrella of services. 
Um, and then under the definition currently in the statute, it also talks about uh, deducting disability related expenses. Um, so calculating income when uh, working with an individual who has a disability. So Erica, could I ask you a quick, quick question? I'm sure. sorry, so I'm confused. Is the pro bono threshold different than the 200% of federal poverty level? Yes. So the pro bono threshold under 6213D, um, I'm going to paraphrase, but it basically says that an organization that um, provides pro bono services can also use this threshold, which is appears under um, the health and safety code, and it's tied to area median income, which is why um, it can vary quite a bit from, it, it's on a county by county basis. So um, the 200% level is statewide and that's applicable in every county. Uh, the pro bono income threshold, it varies from one county to the next. And so with the statutory change in some counties, there really is almost no meaningful difference between 200% and the pro bono income threshold now, uh, but before it was a big difference. Um, and then there are some counties where you, you do still see some variability, but it, it has reduced kind of that disparity, I guess, between. So if you're, an organ, if you're an organization that we've decided qualifies for the pro bono income, uh, whatever it's called, uh, supplement or whatever, that organization can provide legal services across the board to anyone that meets the pro bono threshold? Correct, yes, in, in their county. Um, so if they provide services in multiple counties, they need to apply a different income threshold based on that area and percent of proportion of area median income in that county. Um, and, and like I said, that's how historically it has been applied. That was kind of a question that was answered through this rules committee process. Historically, it was, you know, the office practice was for pro bono allocation recipients. Um, the community, the legal aid community had made the argument that it should apply to any program that has a pro bono project. Um, Ultimately, the recommendation was to confine that to pro bono allocation recipients, but um, but that was a question that came up. Um, and then uh, aside from clarifying this definition under the statute, the other kind of main task uh, identified was how qualified legal services projects can demonstrate indigency um, when working on behalf of a group or a class of persons or an organizational client. So you're not dealing with an individual client where you can do that income screening or you can identify whether they meet any of the other characteristics um, required under 6213D. Um, and that's where the guidance comes in from the eligibility guidelines. So um, took a bit of a deeper dive on ways for organizations to demonstrate that benefit for indigent persons on a broader scale. Um, so things that uh, were identified to put in this new state bar rule were um, a definition of income because income is not defined anywhere um, in the IELTA statute, as well as household. Um, the legal aid community, when we had sought uh, feedback on some of the initial proposals, they requested clarity as well about when it would be appropriate to make exceptions to income. Um, as, I, as we just kind of touched on briefly, we discussed the income threshold for programs with pro bono projects. Um, deducting disability related medical expenses when, when that needs to happen. And um, it was clarified that it needs to be done before calculating income. Um, and then uh, we talked about the existing practice for um, qualifying on a non-means tested basis. So if the person's eligible for SSI um, or eligible under the Older Adults Act, so that was interpreted as individuals who are 60 or older. Um, and then the Developmentally Disabled Assistance Act, uh, which are um, individuals who have any um, identified disability as, as it appears under Title 42 of the US Code. So. Um, we also talked about demonstrating indigency. So like I said, impact litigation and advocacy work activities. Um, organizations file or submit uh, on a yearly basis reports, individual activity reports regarding their their work in this area in the prior year. Um, and so they need to demonstrate currently under the eligibility guidelines that a majority of persons impacted by this activity are indigent. Um, a lot of feedback was given that that is difficult to demonstrate. Organizations can't produce sort of independent research or quantitative evidence that the work they're doing in every instance um, is that those impacted are majority indigent. Um, and so, 
um, there was discussion about ways to help QLSPs standardize sort of the, the reporting requirements, um, as well as to ease the reporting burden because right now they're required to submit up to 25 activity reports um, every year. And um, at the committee level, we talked about how there was probably almost, I think a thousand, yeah, almost about a thousand reports um, from the last year that not only the organizations needed to submit, um, but state bar staff has to read through all of them and ultimately make recommendations to eligibility and budget review. So um, finding a way to still capture work that might not be considered qualifying um, under the governing authorities while uh, making sure that it's handled efficiently. So, so ultimately the outcome of sort of all these discussions, because we've visited this topic a few times in the rules committee, uh, the primary one was to adopt the Legal Services Corporation definition of income, um, which appears under the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, it provides, I think, about 12 or 14 different categories of income, uh, which would standardize what QLSPs would be looking for when they're asking um, their clients to report on their income sources. Uh, the recommendation also includes exceptions to income. Um, for the eligibility guidelines that QLSPs use. It provides additional guidance for when it might be appropriate not to consider somebody a part of a client's household for whatever reason. Um, I believe the example in the proposed rule is you know, in instances of intimate partner violence. Um, so th those eligibility guidelines would still be subject to commission review, but that it would give a little bit better guidance to QLSPs about how to implement the uh, the exceptions. Um, there's also a recommendation to adopt um, clarifications to indigency based on the qualifying characteristics um, I mentioned. Uh, confirmation that disability related costs should be deducted before calculating income. Uh, there was a recent statutory change along with making that change to 200% of the federal poverty level. Um, it's now required under the statute um, to deduct a veteran's disability related compensation uh, from income. So the proposed rule incorporates that, um, that new requirement as well. Um, it confirmed prior office practice about the, the income threshold for pro bono. Um, they're recommending that that be confined to organizations that get the pro bono allocation um, in a given year. <clears throat> there was also a recommendation to uh, reduce the number of individual impact litigation and advocacy work reports that are required. Um, as I said, the, the maximum currently would be 25 in a given year, um, reducing the number of required reports to a maximum of 10. Um, and that recommendation was based on an analysis of sort of the, um, the average uh, number of reports submitted being about 12 um, from any organization. So um, could reliably reduce the number of reports without missing a lot of potentially non-qualifying work, um, as well as setting a minimum 50 hour threshold for reporting on any given activity. Um, and then there was also a recommendation to codify the approach to ILAW reporting um, that it either needs to be demonstrated that a majority of those served or impacted are indigent, or that an organization can make the argument that it may not be a majority or they can't demonstrate that it's a majority, but the reason they undertook the work um, and the nexus of the legal issue to the needs of indigent persons is clear and that it's disproportionately impacting indigent persons. Um, so that is an approach that has been taken um, at the eligibility and budget review committee level in some instances, but it hasn't been codified yet. Um, and so it would this would just confirm that that is an appropriate basis for doing uh, some of this work. And in either instance, it would specify that organizations need to, to provide some amount of evidence or justification for the, this work. Um, so they could do it through uh, independent research. They could do it based on their own internal case data, um, identifying a legal need that is affecting sort of a, a broad swath of their client base. Um, or legal needs identified by other service providers in their area. Um, so it, it, it provided several examples of acceptable evidence because there hadn't been that level of transparency, I think, 
um, among organizations about what, uh, what type of um, evidence would be deemed acceptable when justifying um, the work. Um, and then it also incorporates factors for uh, consideration when working on behalf of an organization. Um, so taking on a nonprofit organizational client um, versus individual clients. So, um, so that's the, the summary of the recommendations, but I'm happy to answer any questions about <clears throat> the proposed rule or the implications of it. Any questions? Will? Does the bar maintain a list of the exceptions, the income exceptions um, for letter D? In, um, in the proposed rule, no. The um, the idea was to provide some guidance of appropriate examples, but um, we didn't necessarily identify every single instance of what would be considered an exception, and so that's why it's subject to commission review. If for some reason it were to come to staff or the commission's attention that there seemed to be unreasonable exceptions being made, um, that it could be, you know, um, as part of our monitoring visits, we look at eligibility guidelines from every organization. So if we were to look at an eligibility guideline and um, think that, you know, uh, some of the exceptions don't sound reasonable, <clears throat> we would be able to follow up at that point. Okay, I guess I'm I'm concerned about the transparency there, making sure that organizations know that. For example, what public advocacy asked about youth clients, can we determine them as eligible even though their household has a lot of money and would not be eligible? Um, and I, I think, I'm not sure if that's maintaining a list that's publicly accessible or my preference would have been, you know, a little clearer, more clarity on the exceptions in the rule, but how can we address the equity part of that? <clears throat> Yeah, um, I think that the if you were to look at the definition of income under the Code of Federal Regulations, um, I believe it has language to the effect of um, defining a household, like as the household is defined by the recipient organization, meaning the grantee. Um, so since it's fairly broad in that definition, we didn't necessarily want to narrow it. Um, organizations are always welcome to come to staff or ask the commission to look at um, their guidelines if they have a question and it's not uncommon for them to ask if what they're doing is qualifying um, or in line with the governing authorities. So um, it didn't seem possible to come up with an exhaustive list of all the things that could be considered exceptions and we didn't want to be overly restrictive in the event that it was missed, something was missed that could be appropriate. So um, it's my understanding that that's why the original recommendation was to provide some examples, but not um, okay. kind of give bullet points of like what's considered an exception and what's not. Jason? That, that certainly makes sense. Sorry, Will, thank you. Jason? This may be overly precise, uh, bordering on pedantic, but I have a recommendation for some language that you have here where it references, uh, and on this slide it says impacted, but I think elsewhere it says affected for mm -hmm. indigent persons and in the other language, it uses the term benefit, which I think is more clear as to what the expected result is. And I would just recommend that benefit be used throughout as opposed to using benefit in one place and then saying uh, that groups are affected, disproportionately affected or impacted mm -hmm. uh, because those are neut neutral terms as opposed to positive framing terms. Yeah, I think, um, and I'm sorry for the inconsistency. I think the um, desired language when we were initially talking about it was disproportionately impacted because um, organizations, you know, the either the outcome will disproportionately benefit indigent persons or the reason they're undertaking the work is because um, indigent persons are being impacted potentially negatively in a disproportionate way. Um, so I think that's why it was intended to be more neutral, but, um, if, you know, everybody, um, is on board with making that change, that's reasonable as well. 
what would it look like? I can pull up the proposed rule. As you can see, those of you who have ever read law review commission reports, this is the equivalent. Hopefully, can you see the proposed rule now? Or? It's very small, Eric. I don't know if you can zoom in. Can you highlight this for us? Can you zoom in? Yes. Um, I believe the reference would be here, if a legal services project cannot demonstrate that a majority of those impacted by the activity are indigent, it must demonstrate that the activity has a disproportionate impact on indigent persons based on the nature of the activity and the specific anticipated outcomes for indigent persons if the activity succeeds. Well, I can't support a change. I, I like that language, that disproportionate impact. I don't know how others others feel, but I, you know, it's 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 close to, you know, disparate impact theory and i just think i like that language <laughs> well, what, what was the proposal though what, to change uh, what to what jason how would you change this to benefit uh correct because that if you scroll up to the the, the other provisions to it too but, but section f uses the term for the benefit of indigent persons and then but disproportionately impacts i think it refers to the thing that is being as Erica described, advocated or represented against, right? In theory. So, and I'm okay with that, but my understanding was that this is for the benefit of indigenous persons and advocating against the negative would be for their benefit as well. Um, so I, I think that's the intent is that it's for their benefit. How would you feel about, for consistency, repeating the entire phrase that Erica has highlighted down below would that yeah i just think i, serve you I think better? that's fine yeah i think consistency is better than anything as reduces potential confusion so we're not changing language we're just repeating that phrase below by adding uh for the benefit of indigent persons or correct instead of disproportionate impact right so the fr the phrases are it's consistent phraseology there in those places Okay. Um, it's Catherine, so it would have both factors, right? Because that's right. what the one is above, right? So it'd be yes. for the benefit of or disproportionate, right. whatever. I, I'm not looking, I can't see far enough up, but I, no, I believe it. it includes both concepts there. And that's right, Catherine. I agree with consistency. So I'm fine if we just use the same phrase for the benefit of indigent person or disproportionately impacts indigent yeah. persons would replace the disproportionate yeah. impact below. Thank you, Jason, for pointing that out. I think it's, I think it's, consistency is the best. It's an improvement. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I guess, it's sort of what I'm struggling with is it's two different bases. So one is it would be for a majority or benefited, um, and then th this third section is strictly focused on disproportionate impact. So, um, yeah, they're 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 like it's there are different ways to qualify it, and it, I think that change would collapse it, which I yeah. feel like make it confusing. Because it, it's basically saying the preference is under subsection two if you can show that a majority of persons impacted or. So you'd be looking for, you know, primarily or majority. Um, and then if you can't demonstrate that, then you can rely on a disproportionate impact argument. <clears throat> mm. I see what you mean. My recommendation is to keep, keep, keep it as a mm -hmm. Okay. I'll withdraw. Okay. Okay. Um, Pam has her hand up. I'm just thinking, are they all not the same people though? 
you're are they all not the same people that you're trying to describe? Um, I think it's it. I mean, the definition of indigent person doesn't change. It's just whether sort of a what you're either talking about the actual numbers of persons impacted. So like 51 percent or more are impacted uh, who are impacted are indigent or you could be taking a smaller percentage, but those who are indigent are impacted to a degree that is greater than perhaps other persons. So it might not be 51% of the people impacted are indigent, it could be a smaller percentage, it could be 30% or whatever it may be, but the, that 30% are significantly impacted or impacted in a way that is more serious or severe. Um, or would be benefited in a way that's more significant than others who happen to be also impacted by the activity. I'm reminded of uh, some of the testimony we received at the working group, uh, the stakeholders meeting, uh, that some of the impact uh, work that's being done by QLSPs has a significant impact on indigent persons, but it also has an impact on a greater number of people who don't meet that uh, definition. Uh, and so is the work worthy of our support if the impact on indigent persons is less than a majority, but it significantly aids them? And, and I, I think uh, this is where judgment comes in. It would be difficult to write a rule to answer all these questions. I, I personally like kind of as Eric described it, the, the idea that even if a non-majority of recipients of the, the work being done are indigent, if the majority of the benefit or disproportionate degree of the benefit received is for those indigent, that indigent class of individuals, that still seems like a worthwhile endeavor to support. Um, you know, I can think of an example where 30% of the individuals affected are indigent um, and the rest are say middle-class individuals or what have you. But 50 plus percent of the benefit, you know, say it's a financial benefit is inured to the benefit of that 30%. That makes sense for what, what we're doing in the spirit of what we're doing. All right. We move Can that, we... do you wanna move the, the reading of the um, motion Resolution. forward? Yes, please. Um, so the uh, proposed resolution is um, resolved that the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission approves the proposed language recommended by the Rules Committee to define and demonstrate indigency as reflected in attachment B to the August 12th, uh, 2022 memorandum on this topic. This is the clarification just uh, that we are not going ahead and changing any of the language. Indeed, and to further clarify, I'll make the motion. That's right. <laughs> just to you make sure a second. everybody's just turn back a few minutes. <laughs> second on Jason. Uh, means second. Uh, let's have a roll call. Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Vanarelli? Yes. Oglagi? Alsaroff? Yes. Ball, Fightmaster Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Bushelli? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Friedman? Friedman? Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. Judge Klein? Yes. Cruz, Lee, Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, everyone who worked on that and for all, for all the questions, I think, you know, was a good process, very good process. So we're on so to- um, We have two more topics for the- Primary um, purpose is Primary next. purpose, and this one will be short um, because it's, uh, Crystal can keep this uh, about five minutes and then, um, and then Erica will be back up. All right, hi everyone. Um, let me start sharing my screen. So the third topic out of four is the um, 
the recommendations from the rules committee related to primary purpose requirement. My view, um, one second, my view is a little bit funky. I'll keep it at this um, view for now. So the relevant governing authorities uh, for the specific codification topic, oh, sorry, also to call out the uh, working group members uh, for the specific topic was Corey Rich and Judge Seligman. Governing authorities related to this topic, uh, Business and Professions Code Section 6213, uh, State Bar Rule 3.671, and then the relevant uh, eligibility guidelines for legal services projects. Um, this topic is specific to qualified legal services projects um, as the primary purpose requirement for support centers uh, will be um, handled uh, separately, uh, similar to the, the topic Erica just discussed. Um, for this topic, there were three codification issues identified. I'm going to give an overview of the discussion. Uh, basically, one, one of the three recommendations is moving forward for the commission's consideration today, but I'll just go over three just to provide um, some context and, and background. Uh, the codification issues identified were um, as follows, whether the commission should codify current office practice um, of using a QLSP's expenditures from its prior fiscal year to determine primary purpose. Uh, whether the 75% of qualified expenditures presumption for satisfying primary purpose requirement under State Bar Rule 3.671 should be changed, and wh whether the Commission should retain discretion to find QLSPs eligible by the Any Other Means Test under State Bar Rule 3.671C. Uh, just for context, uh, this codification topic uh, has been discussed for, for quite some time. Uh, it was initially broached in uh, March of 2020. Uh, the uh, rules working group has met. We conferred with the legal aid community twice uh, for their feedback. And then August 4, the uh, rules committee met um, and then to uh, finalize its recommendations for the commission's uh, consideration today. Uh, this topic, I think, will be in line with the other ones being discussed for this agenda item uh, for consideration at the Board of Chiefs meeting in November of this year. Um, I'll briefly go over this. You, you've heard um, two iterations of, of these updates uh, regarding um, impact of, of on the state bars grants administration process. One is the expanded, expanded income eligibility for legal services projects, which is now 200% of the federal poverty level. Um, the IELTSA statute, which has been updated to include expungement work and the proposed updates to define civil legal services. Um, I will highlight, th highlight that these um, updates were uh, sort of a key consideration uh, with the rules committee when determining um, how to handle the uh, working group's recommendations and what they decided to move forward or um, sort of uh, keep at bay. So the first topic is, is pretty administrative um, and this is a topic that will be moving forward. Uh, this is the fiscal year for qualified expenditures calculation. Uh, currently, State Bar Rule 3671 uh, requires organizations proposed budget for the coming grant year and the organization's expenditures in its most re recent fiscal year to demonstrate uh, primary purpose. When you consider current office practice, we actually just look at the percentage of expenditures um, only from the most reporting year. Um, to note, organizations are not asked to submit budget information until they're found eligible by the commission. Um, so the uh, recommendation from the Rules Committee is to codify office practice by deleting reference to calculating primary purpose based on budget information. Um, it did, the current rules don't reflect uh, current office practice and then practically in terms of the grants administration process, um, it's, it's, it's slightly inaccurate as it's currently uh, written. Uh, the second topic, which had uh, probably the most extensive discussion, was regarding the 75% qualified expenditure threshold. Uh, and then under three, uh, State Bar Rule 3.671, and then the eligibility guidelines, QLSPs are going to meet primary purpose if 75% of more or more of its budgets and expenditures is de designated to provide uh, free civil legal services. Um, so currently office practice is that staff elevates all QLSPs with less than 75% of qualified expenditures to the eligibility and budget review committee. Uh, there's an informal guideline that QLSPs for report 50% uh, do not meet primary purpose. And this exemplar is grabbed from the, the memo in terms of the number of QLSPs that have been um, elevated for uh, the committee and, and the commission's consideration in, in past years. Uh, generally, the commission has generally accepted the explanations from applicants with qualified expenditures uh, with more than 50% and, and found that they meet primary purpose for the reasons listed on the slide. 
Um, in, gen in October 2020, um, when the working group met, uh, is generally in favor of lowering, lowering the percentage to a range of 51 to 60. And then um, in 2022, it met again and considered um, those three updates uh, that have been highlighted and then the recent community feedback. Uh, the working group recommendation, which was uh, not approved by the Rules Committee at its August 4 meeting was to uh, codify office practice and lower the threshold to 60% uh, and then establish a minimum threshold of 50. Uh, one, one key consideration is that because of all the new changes, uh, there was actually not uh, sufficient information to sort of determine the impact of, uh, because of the expansion of the definition of the civil legal services, expanded, expanded income eligibility and, and so forth, um, there was no way to truly understand um, how many kilos fees would be impacted. Um, I think the Rules Committee uh, assumed that majority, if not um, all of kilos fees would not meet the 75%. So it didn't feel at this time that it would be appropriate to um, discuss lowering the threshold without seeing uh, a few years of data and uh, sort of determining the impact and whether or not this codification topic um, should require action by the Rules Committee um, and the Commission. Um, the, the third topic is related to number two. This is the any other means test. Um, so under uh, Super Rule 3.671C and the eligibility guidelines, uh, this allows uh, gives the commission discretion um, to find organizations that do not meet the 75% test as eligible if they demonstrate by other means mm -hmm. that the main purpose uh, is to provide legal services without charge to indigent persons. Um, any other means, so this is really commission discretion. The working group recommendation was to, in line with its prior recommendation, um, maintain commission discretion uh, regarding the any other means tests and include uh, language noting reasons why and when this test would be used. Um, there was a 50% um, minimum threshold uh, sort of recommended previously, but since that recommendation didn't go forward, accordingly, this one wouldn't and the rule would maintain um, keep as it is. Uh, so what that really leads to is one slight administrative update to Rule 3.671A, uh, which just deletes reference of the, the budget of the prior fiscal year, more so so that um, the rules uh, reflect uh, current office practice uh, and also the, the flow of the grants administration process. Um, there are some other updates on the eligibility guidelines. Um, uh, mostly for, for style and then also uh, similar references to delete um, this, this budget information, uh, but it's, it's, it's pretty administrative. Um, I can pause for any questions, but um, the proposed resolution is on the screen as well, um, if, if there are none. I don't know at this late date, Pam, you've got your hand up. Uh, yes, go ahead, no, no, finish your comment that at this uh, late hour, people are focused on it, but the, the comment on data is important. And we don't know what the uh, change in the um, definition uh, to 200% is going to mean in terms of expenditures. And rather than change the rule from 75 to 60 now, the thought of the, the committee was let's wait in, uh, for a year or two and see what changes are brought about as a result. So uh, Pam, over to you. You take away the, the budget information, how are we gonna determine that? So the data is very critical in making that decision. So I agree 100%. Okay. Could, could you go back to the slide? What was the interlineation on item C on the slide two slides ago? No, the, the, the one you just, go the next slide. Yeah, that one. No, the one you were just on, Sorry. right there. It's a delete reference to the, the budget for the fiscal year because we don't look at the, the budget. No, no, I see that. I'm looking at item C. Okay, so that one, um, I, I will, I, I think that was a, the rule, the proposed amendment is for A. See this, I need to reject this, um, this, this track okay. change. All so right. it'll, it'll, it'll stay as is. Uh, the vote, the, the, the resolution, I think, focuses is only on A, Eric. Okay. A and the eligibility, relevant eligibility guidelines. All right, so let's have a motion on this resolution and any other questions if people have. 
I don't see any other questions. So Catherine will move the proposed resolution. I'll second. Second from Christian. Uh, let's do a roll call, please. Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Schreiber? Chris, are you yes. still there? Okay, thank you. Vanarelli? Yes. Oglagi? Asaraf? Yes. Ball? Fightmaster? Bennett? Dane? Excuse me, is that? I'm sorry, Ms. Sandman. Have a Abstain. Abstain. Blakemore? Yes. Bushelli? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Friedman? Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. <clears throat> Judge Klein? Yes. Cruz? Lee? Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, bear with us. We have one more um, codification topic about um, We're down to the home stretch. The, the client's complaint. Um, Erica. Okay. Um, so I'll go through the rules committee recommendations regarding um, complaints uh, from the public against legal aid grantees. Uh, the working group for this was Will Buscelli and Pamela Bennett. Um, <clears throat> so there is a current state bar rule um, in terms of governing authorities, 3.692 deals with uh, complaints against grantee organizations that um, receive state bar funding. Um, and uh, this rule encompasses anything from the initiation of a complaint through the time that the commission would make a decision on that complaint. Um, it references all the other applicable governing authorities like the IELTA statute, other state bar rules, NARC grant agreements. Um, it has fairly narrow application in that it, it does deal with just the governing authorities for, um, for these grants. So things that could be handled under a complaint um, under this rule would be things like alleging that an organization is using the wrong income eligibility threshold um, or that they are charging indigent clients and not reporting that on their grant applications um, or they have no form of a uh, grievance procedure or they're not following that policy that they have. Um, those would be sort of appropriate topics to be brought under a complaint under this rule. Um, it wouldn't typically include allegations about individual attorney misconduct um, or dissatisfaction with the level of service um, that an, an individual client received if it is a client. Um, so uh, that first example would normally go through the state bar's office of the chief trial counsel and then uh, dissatisfaction with level of service is usually an internal um, issue that can, you know, the organization can address with their their client or their former client, um, and uh, is generally referred back to the organization in those instances unless some other sort of non-compliance becomes apparent. Um, under the rule, possible outcomes would be dismissal of the complaint. Uh, prescribing some sort of corrective action for the grantee to come into compliance. Um, or termination of funding uh, with a right to appeal to state bar court um, in the event of a very serious uh, non-compliance issue. Um, under the current rule, um, a formal written complaint needs to be filed with state bar staff um, and staff has 90 days to attempt an informal resolution. Um, if there is no resolution, then a report would be sent to the commission. Um, and then the commission or a committee appointed by the commission would review the report and any response from both the complainant and grantee um, and decide whether to dismiss at that point or have an informal conference. Um, and then one of those uh, three actions I described could be the outcome of the conference, whether it's dismissal, corrective action, or termination. Um, the dismissal and corrective action would be final decisions, but as I said, if it's a termination of funding decision, um, that would provide the grantee an, an opportunity to appeal um, and if they don't timely appeal, then the decision would become final. Um, so some issues that were identified uh, with current practice or the current rule. Um, one was that there's very infrequent application of this rule at this point. Um, we only receive a small number of complaints um, that would fall under this rule in any given year, um, usually fewer than five. Um, so there isn't frequent um, application of sort of the provisions of the current rule. Um, it 
requires a, a formal written complaint. Um, so finding a way to facilitate the complaints coming in if um, you know the public wants to submit them, that was an issue that was identified. Um, the rule is not clear about what it means to resolve a complaint. So from whose perspective and at what stage um, can you resolve the complaint? Um, the current practice from staff's perspective, at least at the stage that we would be trying to attempt resolution is that we would need to get an affirmative agreement from both the complainant and the grantee. And that's not, not always possible. Um, and so some complaints proceed, not because there's sort of an active opposition uh, to staff's recommended resolution, but not getting an affirmative agreement to close it. Um, the timelines and the rule currently are also vague um, and could let complaints languish um, because they are just either not clearly defined, um, confusing, or they um, are vague and say things like within a reasonable amount of time um, without further elaboration. So those were some of the main issues with the current rule. Um, so when this was discussed at the rules committee level, um, the recommendations that you saw in the um, proposed edits to the rule to clarify timelines. So um, it would be making every stage of the complaint process uh, much clearer in terms of the timeline allowed, for example, for staff resolution, the timeline that's required to provide the grantee with a copy of the complaint, um, the time given to uh, the commission or an advisory body of the commission in order to hold things like an informal conference and the like. Um, so it's intended to move things forward at a reasonable pace and one that everyone can have sort of the same expectation uh, about when uh, certain steps will be taken. Um, the recommendation is also to allow confidential complaints. Um, so if a, uh, a complainant wants to submit um, a complaint but doesn't necessarily want to identify themselves to the grantee that um, that would be permitted under the rule. Um, the recommendation is also to encourage early resolution and elevate as necessary. So there are options to you know, resolve it at the staff level. If it's not done at the staff level, then there was a recommendation to create this two-person advisory committee, um, which would make the process a little more flexible, um, encourage open conversation among the parties, um, and a in more in-depth analysis of the issues that are being presented, um, as well as to conserve the commission's resources. So in this instance, the advisory committee would be appointed by the co-chairs um, or the chair of the commission, um, or sorry, of the executive committee. And um, if it's an advisory committee, um, it's not subject to Bagley Keene requirements. So these informal conferences really could be sort of more private and informal. Uh, to encourage, encourage resolution. Um, and then the recommendation was to have the final decision made by the executive committee. So um, once the advisory committee concludes its informal conference that it would make a recommendation to the executive committee um, for a final decision, except in the instance of any consideration of termination of funding, which would go through the full commission. Um, there was a little bit of a, a point of, uh, change that staff made to this uh, based on the prior recommendation to the rule you're seeing today. So previously the recommendation had been to actually allow the advisory body to resolve um, the complaint if everybody agrees. So if the advisory body makes their recommendation and the complainant and grantee are in agreement, um, that would subject, subject it to Bagley Keen up and meeting requirements. Um, so staff did uh, point that out in the memo and make a recommendation um, about if, if, if the desire is to keep it more informal um, at that level to, to not allow resolution at the advisory body level and to have all final decisions go through the executive committee. If the commission is okay with it being open meetings and wants to go that route, then we can put that provision back in. But I just wanted to be clear that that was a recommendation from staff and was not discussed at the rules committee level because that was something we identified when further reviewing the proposed rule. Um, and then uh, sort of a more administrative change was updating rule 3.690, which has to do with receipt of documents, um, just to clarify that um, electronic service and use of email are acceptable forms of transmitting documents. Um, and then the last recommendation was something that again, was made at the rules committee level. There was a desire to have some sort of provision 
to deal with individuals who may be submitting repeated baseless complaints um, or non-meritorious complaints um, and to, to have a more expeditious way of dealing with those. Um, so staff had been tasked with working in language related to that, um, but upon further research since that last meeting, um, it's not recommended to actually inc include a provision like that because this is um, untested and it's hard to know what standard to use at the, at the moment. Um, as I mentioned, we only receive a few complaints currently. We are looking into creating a reporting or um, a reporting page for individuals to submit complaints online. Um, so that may change. We may get more complaints um, using that platform or that avenue, um, but it remains to be seen. And so the recommendation would be to not actually work that into the rule at the moment. And if it becomes an issue, then it can be revisited. Um, Brady, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add on that, that particular point. Um, uh, no, I mean, at, after the last meeting, uh, I went and I looked at um, a few vexatious litigants type provisions. Um, there's one in the um, that was only passed in the past uh, uh, year or two um, in the state bar rules for state bar complainants. Um, I looked at uh, federal provisions, state provisions, and there are so many different thresholds and different ways of determining um, who is um, who is uh, a, a vexatious litigant. Um, and given that we don't, we haven't had a problem yet, we don't know if we will have a problem or, or what it will be. Um, I was sort of at a loss for um, how, we, how we would define a problem that we haven't seen yet. Um, the other thing I, I thought as I, you know, read some of these provisions is that they all, um, there has to be a determination and there has to be a way to get the, the designation removed and or um, in a particular case, if, if it's meritorious, for some review to happen to let a complaint forward because you can't just shut the doors to everyone. And, and that makes more sense, um, I think, in, in those forum where you're entitled to more process, where you know a lot of process happens before you can even get to a merits determination versus here, where the very first thing that happens um, is that staff tries an informal resolution and comes up with a recommendation. So um, both because it's not clear that creating a process would actually save any time, and because we don't know what the problem is yet, um, I, I, I didn't feel that I could propose a, a rule that would make sense. Pam. Okay. My question is on coming from page seven of our memo. So if we had a a uh, five person advisory committee, would that open us up to Backley Keene versus yes. the two person? Yeah, so the, the two person was specifically chosen, I mean, not just to conserve resources, but also because anything over two individuals, my understanding is that it would be uh, potentially <clears throat> um, needing to be an open forum. Any other questions? Erica, I, do you I wasn't sure, sure if Erica was done. Yeah, um, that yes, I am finished with the summary of what came out of the last meeting. Yeah. Okay, then I, I had a, a question. Um, uh, forgive me, I didn't get much sleep and been back and forth. So I'm uh, not as articulate as I would like to be. But, um, after reviewing our changes from our rules committee meeting, I was wondering if it might be possible to add a final check on uh, G, the clause G there. Um, if the commission, uh, if the executive committee decides to dismiss the complaint or require corrective action, the decision is final. And I'm wondering if it's possible, and I can go into the reasons, but given our time constraints, I, I'll just ask the question first to allow a member of the commission, any member of the commission to also ask that it be reviewed by the full commission um, so that we have a check because it's so difficult to go through on, on the client side, to go through a complaint process and you really, 
<laughs> you're looking for um, a resolution. And if it's gotten to this far, um, I feel like because of certain statutory changes, I would want a check on that final decision-making authority. And the best idea I could come up with is just allowing a commission member to say, hey, actually let's discuss this before the full commission. I don't know if that's allowed or if that's the best way to have a, a check on that, but I wanted to get some feedback and see if that was possible. A well, question, couldn't they go to the state bar? No, this is the decisions. If they feel it's, there's it's some fine. attorney misconduct, whatever, and competency, wouldn't that be a, another place they could go rather than the commission? My understanding is not, but somebody with more knowledge should answer that. Yes, and, and certainly I think um, when staff receives a complaint, if it's more in the nature of, or if it also raises disciplinary um, um, allegations against a, a licensee, um, they would either um, uh, tell the complainant, make a complaint to OCTC, or sometimes I think that if there's, if we have enough, we'll just forward the complaint to OC, OCTC, which is the Office of Chief Trial Counsel, which investigates attorney misconduct. Um, and, and, and I know in, in, at least in response to attorney misconduct, I presume here staff could say, oh, you might also have a, a civil claim. We can't give you advice on that, but you may, may wish to consult an attorney. Um, but I think Will's, Will's question is, is really um, on whether there should be, um, or his point is that suggesting there should be the opportunity for further review of you know, the, the limited complaints that do go through this process, which is, um, which is a complaint that a grantee uh, is uh, violating uh, grant provisions um, at, at, in some way that it, it doesn't rise to um, a recommendation to terminate their funding. My, 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 response, my response to Will is that I, I really think there's sufficient process in this. You've got an attempt to essentially, you know, your fact finding, uh, an opportunity to be heard, a, uh, a, a, a meeting of the parties, so to speak. Um, and I think that, I know you weren't here at the beginning of the meeting, but I was speaking about um, the importance of uh, trusting the committee work, that the committee work is so essential. And so uh, I just think that um, an executive committee reviewing it um, after the other reviews that have taken place previously is going to be sufficient. And, you know, I, I've been on the <laughs> commission for a decade and you know, only only one. I know of only you know one complaint that ever really came forward and became a, a big issue. But um, so I, I just feel that's what's being proposed. And I think you were on this. I thought you were on this <laughs> working group. So I guess you had some final thoughts. But I, I think this is sufficient. That's my take on it. Uh, I just wanted to respond to Judge Klein's comment. The jurisdiction of the commission to hear. Com complaints is quite limited. It has to do with the uh, purposes and policies of the um, use of IALTA money in, in the IALTA program. And it is an allegation, presumably, that the grantee is not performing within those policies and guidelines, somehow violating the uh, enabling legislation. Um, matters that relate to attorney misconduct uh, are not within the jurisdiction of the commission. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, Brady. I, I think that's what we confronted last October. That's what Kim was referring to. Yeah, I think it's statutory. I mean, right. it was statutory, not, not just guidelines. I think it's specifically an allegation that the program is not um, complying with the statute. Right. Yeah, and it could be, I mean, it, it, some might be both. They, they could say, you know. Right. X attorney did this to me, which uh, gets referred to OCTC for evaluation as a, a disciplinary issue. Um, but then we might still have a talk um, to see if there's, you know, any problems with the um, administration and governance that that you know this problem wasn't wasn't caught from a management perspective. That, that was yeah. my understanding. Yeah, just 
to finish that, that thought, we have had issues, uh, but very, very rare, as Kim pointed out. And, and uh, the, the commission is statutorily um, enabled to be an arbiter, the final arbiter on funding and uh, defunding. And, and that's where our jurisdiction extends. Correct. Will's got his hand up. Have we answered questions for yeah. you? Yeah, I would just want to thank you, Kim. I, I think that is, that is an excellent point. And I, I totally agree with um, that idea that we're, we farm out a lot of work to the committees. What I hadn't realized when we uh, decided on this um, was now the executive committee, and maybe I don't fully understand the process, but statutorily is appointed by the judicial council, not by the commission itself. And so it's, it felt to me like it's less our executive committee and more another group's executive committee. Mm -hmm. And having a, a permanent delegation of authority felt I was less comfortable with. Whereas we obviously temporarily, because you know, I, you know, Rich and you, I, I'd be fine. This, but you aren't permanent. It turns out, uh, much to my disappointment, <laughs> I would. I think you guys are great. I think we're losing a great deal of knowledge there. But that's aside from this issue, and that's where my once I realized that my opinion shifted, and I felt like we might want, as a commission, exercising our authority to have a check. Okay, I understand your point now. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure, Duan. Do you want to? Oh yeah, I, I just oh, oh, just want to just what just wanted to add. Yeah. So yeah. you know, SB two eleven does this change um, who gets to appoint the chair and the co-chair, but um, they're appointed from from the commission itself, like commissioners. It's it's yeah. So. Right, right. But they the judicial council they appoint the the seven no term members and also our executive committee. And I think that's a, a significant change and that's where the permanent delegation of authority caused me to pause. Obviously, I assume they'll exercise that, that power judiciously, um, but it, you know, I, I guess- gonna, Bonnie's gonna speak, but before, oh, sure. which will be very helpful, but I think that there are recommendations which are made to the judicial council to consider, but Bonnie, you should educate us. <laughs> sure, um, thank you. And um, I'm sorry, Will, I know that you reached out on this. Um, so this is a new process for the judicial council. Actually, the appointments are made by the chief justice. Um, this is a new process for us uh, under the, the new statute. Um, the uh, 10 appointments have been made since 1999. So there's no change there. Uh, and there are, there are term limits, um, generally four years on those terms, though they can be extended. Um, and then uh, but normally we have an open application process for the judicial council appointments. And then the recommendations um, we always have to produce is, if at all possible, three nominations for each uh, or three candidates for each position. Um, and those are reviewed with the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission staff and um, with leadership because the recommendations that go to uh, the Chief Justice come from the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission. So the recommendations for the what are now co-chairs and vice chairs are coming from the commission itself. Now, um, after staff and the commission make recommendations, it goes through a whole process. And um, that's really secret. And I honestly don't know, <laughs> other than the fact that they spend a lot of time and look who, you know, think about who's uh, appropriate and that kind of thing. And and we don't know yet who the, um, uh, who's going to be appointed for this coming year. I'm sure it's coming soon, but we don't we don't have that date yet, um, but I would be surprised if there was a difference between the trust fund commission recommendation and 
the Chief Justice, but again, um, it's really up to, to her uh, in terms of making those those appointments. But those are just the four the co-chairs and the co-vice chairs in the current structure. So I'm not sure if there are other people on the executive committee or not. No, that, that, that's the full composition of the executive okay. committee as I understand it. But so it's good to hear that it will be going through the same recommendation process as, as we've previously observed right. with the Board of Trustees is what it right. sounds like. Right. Okay. It's just going through the council rather than the state bar. Yeah. Okay. I think that makes me feel a lot more comfortable. Okay. Th about th our... Thank you all for bringing that up. It was a very fine point, you know, but I think it was good. You got your questions answered. Um, we're, I think we need to move on to a vote on um, this proposal. So if we could bring that, the language up on the screen. I'll motion for our super awesome complaints process. Thank you, Erica and Dan. We worked real hard. Okay, Will has made the motion. I'll second it. I'll do roll call. Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Shriver? Yes. Venerelli? Yes. Oglagi? Yes. Welcome, Banache. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Ball? Yes. Oh, you're back. <laughs> I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, Fightmaster? Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Bashelli? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Friedman? Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. Klein? Oh, sorry, Judge Klein? Cruz? I, I was moved, Anita. I'm oh, okay, sorry. Thank yes. you, Judge Klein. Um, Cruz? Lee Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. All right, we're on to item uh, G. This is similar to a prior item on um, a um, delegation of authority. Great. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Rich. And, and um... My, my, the two items, G and H, are both pretty quick compared to everything else. So I can do mine in just a few minutes, I think. Perfect. So, um, so, the, so in this one PowerPoint deck, I'll cover both the um, timeline and delegations of authority for HP4, and then a, um, a rather straightforward request from CLA SoCal. Um, so for the Homelessness Prevention 4 grants, um, the, the Budget Act of 2022 lays out a very, very similar, very similar parameters to the Homelessness Prevention 3 grants. And I will just start by saying that the staff's and Homelessness Prevention Funds Committee's recommended timeline and delegations of authority are substantively um, uh, the same as what Danielle described for the the consumer debt legal services grants. I think like the timeline, it might be shifted by a couple of days, but the delegation of authorities are all like the same. Whereas her grants, the, the, the consumer debt ones would go through the executive committee though. The HP4 grants would unsurprisingly go through the HP funds committee. Um, I did want to take just some like a minute tops to just describe a couple things that change just so you all know about it uh, between HP3 and HP4. So the Homelessness Prevention 3 grants arose under the Budget Act of 2021. So you probably last heard about this last summer and HP4 arises under the Budget Act of 2022. For HP3, um, you may recall that um, uh, there's $80 million available over a three-year period for those Homelessness Prevention Legal Aid grants. The Budget Act of 2021 allocated 40 million of it up front, and then the other 40 million is, is, is trickling in over time. So we got another 20 million in this year's Budget Act, and we expect another 20 million next year, but that whole 80 million was already granted out. Um, as well as the 20 million that came in this year for the HP3 grants, the Budget Act of 2022 creates the HP4 grants with $30 million. Um, Unlike HP3, which uses federal funds, state, a coronavirus state fiscal recovery funds, 
HP4 goes back to just using state equal access fund dollars. I'm in row three now of this table. Um, like previous HP grants, it's available to current qualified legal services projects and support centers as defined by statute. The permissible activities for HP4 is the same as HP3. The next slide has it, but it hasn't really changed. Um, unlike HP1, 2, and 3, HP4, and this is the same with, with the consumer debt grants this year, it's now competitive only. So there's no formula grants this time. Um, also unlike HP3, there's no, what we used to call the no supplantation clause. It used to be a clause that said, these grants can't be used to supplant other dollars. Uh, the idea was it had to be used to create new projects or save projects that were running out of funding. The, the legislature deliberately removed that clause this time from HP4. Um, it kept, the legislature kept its, its statutory preference in this competitive grant um, making for projects that serve rural or underserved communities. Legislature increased the administrative cost cap to 5%. But again, it's uh, the state bar, California and Judicial Council can only claim from that the actual cost of administering the grants. So anything that's left over goes back to grantees. Um, and then it, it does have a different spend down. To, the HP4 grants have to be spent down or encumbered by June 30th, 2024. This is all in the memo. I just key interesting key public policy differences i'm not going to read the um this whole sentence from the budget act 2022 i'll just say the scope of permissible work is the same as for hp3 um so this this is you've seen this before but essentially these grants fund homelessness prevention legal aid lots of examples of what that looks like and it actually ends the very last clause uh it just ends with, with what we call the catch-all provision and homelessness prevention This timeline and, um, and proposed roles from the HP Funds Committee, very, very similar to what Danielle described earlier with the Consumer Debt Legal Services Grants, same delegations of authority. It would be the HP Funds Committee instead of the Executive Committee um, and very similar dates. So just to go through it, because the next slide has the resolution, um, the commission today would, would, would a vote on its timeline and delegations of authority. Uh, staff and the HP Funds Committee recommends that the committee, like with HP3, approve the RFP and scoring rubric uh, at the end of the of August. Um, staff would release the application and RFP um, within um, uh, a few, nine days. Uh, applications would be due about a month later. The dates are approximate to reflect applicant, staff, and grant and commissioner needs, but um, about a month later. The committee would um, advise a commissioner staff scoring team by reading a selection of proposals. So usually the HP Funds Committee will read like five proposals um, and we, we call it rubric calibration. And then the, the team of commissioners and staff would then actually score all the applications, including those five that the committee read. Um, eventually the committee would make award recommendations to the commission and the commission would have final authority uh, and the grant would start on January 1st. I, I I know we're running behind schedule, so I just kind of like right through that. But I, I was hoping it was so similar to the consumer debt that it would it seem familiar. So the, the, now it's the resolution. But if there are questions, oh yeah, uh, Jim. Yeah, I think uh, given the change we did to the consumer debt uh, resolution, as far as submission to the commission language, that we probably should have the same language in our resolution here. Great. Um, and I, as, as you were all doing that, I, I opened up the slide deck for this one and I went ahead and added some language in here to do that. It, I think I um, worded it slightly differently though. So feel free to wordsmith it. So let me read it the whole thing out loud and then we can, we can edit the language at the bottom. So resolved that the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission approves the timeline and roles for 2023-2024 Homelessness Prevention, HP4 grants as presented in the Homelessness Prevention Funds Committee's August 12, 2022 memo. And it is further resolved that the commission delegates authority to the committee to approve the request for proposals, including scoring rubric for the HP4 grants and to a commissioner's staff team to score applications in consultation with the committee. And then this was the part I added for the committee's award recommendations to the commission. I'm sorry, I don't actually remember exactly how it was worded in Danielle's. I just remember it was like, we wanted to be clear that the commission makes the awards. So I can change that at the very bottom there if anybody wants to, to tinker with it.
I think we said for the commission to make final approval. Uh, for me to edit the slide, I have to exit screen. I'll go back into share screen. The final approval by the commission. All right, would that change? Uh, any questions? I think, I mean, it's it's yeah. fine. I'm not sure the language, because it got rid of the make rec. I thought it was like make recommendations for final approval by the committee. Like the, yeah. I We're think there's some words that out. too much got taken out, but. Yeah, you're right, Captain. That seems reasonably close, if not identical to me. And I will make the motion if there aren't other comments or questions. I'll second. Okay, I'll do roll call. Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Vanarelli? Oglagi? Yes. Asaroff? Asaroff? Amin, are you still there? Ball? Yes. Fightmaster? Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Bushelli? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Friedman? Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. Judge Klein? Yes. Cruz? Lee? Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just, if it's okay with the co-chairs, I'll just move right on to the next item, which is in the same PowerPoint deck. Please, I'll please. just, just to show you what this one is, it's the VH, the request <laughs> from CLA SoCal. Um, so this is this is also kind of like, I, I don't know, maybe it's an, a, um, an understatement to call this kind of a housekeeping item, but, um, Community Legal Aid SoCal is one of the commission's homelessness prevention to grant formula grant recipients. So there was competitive and formula. So for their formula grant, they caught a clerical error in their deliverables for years two and three. And they, they are now in year two of that grant. So that's when they caught it. Um, so they've submitted a written request. It was posted with today's materials as their letter to the HP Funds Committee. The HP Funds Committee has met about this and has voted to recommend to the commission that it okay this correction to their deliverables. Essentially, the, the clerical error resulted in them projecting that their case, their 0.24 FTE, so less than a quarter time FTE on this project, case manager would handle 120 clients per year to a more realistic 50 clients per year. The drop is technically so big that we have to, staff has to run it through the committee and the commission. But, um, but the, the practice has been an HP funds committee's sort of position on it was um, for clerical errors like this, you know, the, the committee is sympathetic to it. And since it's a formula grant, the, they were statutorily entitled to this funding if the work they proposed qualified. Um, the, the sort of operative question in these situations is, would it have been approved, their statutory eligibility, um, anyway? And it was clear in this case it would have been. The, the work, the nature of the work still meets the statutory criteria. It's the magnitude to the work that's shrinking, but only because of a clerical mistake. So if they were going to fall out of eligibility, if the work were no longer going to qualify, that would be like a, a question, like, do you still qualify for this grant? The work is staying the same. The size is being corrected. Um, Eric. So I'm just wondering why we're even voting on this. Hmm. I mean, we, we have situations. Great question. <laughs> I mean, for example, in partnership grants, um, I, I, I looked at the evaluation reports submitted by the projects and a number of them, you know, fell way short of their deliverables um, that they projected. And there was no vote. It was just a factor in terms of continuing to fund them. So, I mean, why are we doing this? Why are we even voting on this? 
That's a great question because there's two ways this could come up. Like they could just report at the end of the grant period, like, hey, we came in way under. Let us know if you want to know why, you know, there was a clerical mistake. And there wouldn't really be a moment where this would go back to the commission. That's a great question because they raised it proactively and are seeking um, a permission to proceed with the lower target. We, we run it back through just because the statute says that the commission um, has to approve these projects. So, so because, it's because of the timing of when they raise it and they want they want the formal approval of it. Um, had they done what some programs do, which is just not say anything, and then at the end sort of look on paper like they under delivered and just sort of explain what happened, this would not have come up to the commission. Good so policy based, question as to like what you prefer. So based on that, I think we should move it forward. Unless there I do want to just clarify one thing that Chris just said. There, there is an instance, even though we look at the reporting requirements, where we might bring it forward. Say, for example, they didn't deliver any services, right? There's then an internal control of questions, and we would raise it to, to the commission. Um, right. Oh, like on the back end, like when yeah. we, we read their final reports. Yes. Oh, yes, yeah, thank you. That's a glaring omission on my part. Yeah, if, if, it, if they looked like they didn't do the work or something. Um, Kim, do we have time for Pamela's question? Sure, if not, it's okay. <laughs> no, I just wondered how much that um, 50, that 50 client um, being serviced per year, how much that decreased their funding versus the 120? So their funding will stay the same because um, the, this is an HP2 formula grant. So the grant, the award size was determined by um, the statutory formula for this grant. So, so the um, the size of the award was never tied to the number of deliverables. Unlike the HP, unlike the competitive grants where there it is tied to the size of like their project. Yeah, good question. Yeah, there was a good clarifying question. Thank you, yeah. Pamela. Uh, we have a hand raised in the attendees list. Amy Goldman from CLA. Uh, Kim, it's up to you. You know, <laughs> can you give us one minute, please? <laughs> I just yes. want, I just wanted to say I'm here for community, come from community legal aid. If, if you had any questions for me and that we'll still be serving the same amount of housing clients, it'll just be uh, a more appropriate number of who gets the additional case manager on their legal team. Thank you, Amy, okay. for joining, for Thank coming you. to the meeting in case the commissioners had questions. It's Catherine, I would move the resolution unless there's other questions. Second. Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Vanarelli? Aglagi? Yes. Al Saraf? Yes. Ball? Yes. Fightmaster? Bennett? Yes. Lakemore? Yes. Bashelli? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Friedman? Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Abstain for the reasons I articulated. Not a good use of the commission's time to be doing this. Judge Klein? I'm with uh, Eric Iskin. Abstain. Cruz, Lee, Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes, and Chris, thanks for the expedited presentation. Motion passes. Great, thank you, everybody. All right, we're on to liaison reports. These should uh, uh, begin with Bonnie. Thank you. Um, but I'll be quite short. I know that you're um, extremely busy and I will say that we were, uh, we filed the um, first annual report for the COVID housing funding um, for the $40 million uh, that was received last year and um, have worked closely with State Fire staff um, on the evaluation of that program and are working on um, 
the new requirement for a report to the Department of Finance um, that will be submitted in January that will provide more evaluation information, which um, I hope will be of interest to Rich and, and others. Um, and uh, just really want to commend State Bar staff on just a, a terrific job, as well as the programs that have provided information, um, thorough information in a timely manner. Thank you. Happy to answer the questions. Is Selena here? I believe she's on vacation. Zach she's is not, but um, I'm here. Newman is here from LAC. Okay. Everybody, I'll be very quick. Zach Newman, senior attorney at LAC, here on behalf of Selena Copeland and LAC. Um, my remarks are going to be very short. I just wanted to say, Thank you on behalf of LAC and the legal aid community for um, working so closely with us. I think the, you know, as reflected in the robust analysis in the memos, um, it was a very effective process in terms of this rules revision segment. And so I think that between the focus groups, et cetera, um, the bar strategy was, was very effective in this, this round. And I think we, along with the legal aid community, um, just appreciated the work that went into that um along with the transparency and and everything else so thanks to our staff for including us thank you zach all right we are at the end of a very long arduous uh, agenda uh, eric's got his hand up yeah, just a quick question to follow up on a point you made at the outset, Rich, about the importance of what we do and what impact we're having i'm wondering if we're going to get an impact report to just assess whether the money we're spending is doing any good. I'm sure it is, but I thought we were going to get one, I guess, is why I'm raising the question. You know, one of the things that uh, we run up against frequently is that the cost of an impact report reduces the dollars available for grant making. Um, but I have to say, uh, after all of the years I've been here, I. I really don't think we get the sort of data that we need in, to improve our game, to step it up. And uh, we, we are required for quality control purposes to see to it that grant recipients are performing to the standards that we set. Uh, and that's awfully hard to do without an evaluation. And uh, th this is something that I, I hope will be worked on by the commission in years to come. Don of Shea. I'll actually defer to Duong because I think she might have a point on this issue. I have a separate issue. Oh yeah, just just on the evaluations, as Bonnie just mentioned, um, you know, the state bar staff and the judicial council staff um, have been working really hand in hand the last year um, to prop up the the EF reporting that's required by the DOF and also with the homelessness prevention funding. So the the next um, report that will be finalized for DOF, we will share um, with the commission, and you'll see that it's an enormous data set and it's 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 requiring on our state bar staff between four and six people and on the uh, judicial council staff uh, an equal amount it's a team i mean jim's been at these meetings it's an incredible incredible amount of work for us but 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 to underscore for, for programs we collect an enormous amount of data already um it, it's just yes uh, i think the missing link is um presenting it to you all it's done at the committee level, but as a full commission to talk about discussed um, at a full commission. Catherine, and then Jim. Just in follow up, I, I it wasn't clear to me if we were going to receive a copy of the report that um, Bonnie mentioned, and it would be helpful to receive that if you could just circulate it, meaning it's publicly available. I think that's a good way for us to just start learning about the impact. And I really appreciate your efforts, Dwan and Bonnie, to do that, not only on that report, but also for EAF. I look forward to, to seeing what, you're, what you've been doing. We plan to share it um, once, once it's final, it's at DOF, and then do a presentation in case there are questions, because um, there is more data beyond that, that report that we can obviously dive into and have a more robust discussion. Jim. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment that, um, you know, in the past with uh, Stephanie, we did have the reboot committee where we were trying to standardize metrics and measures being collected. Uh, I've sat in a lot of the evaluation 
committee and watch the staff and uh, the judicial council people spend a lot of time on terms of trying to validate the outputs that they're asking the uh, grantees to provide. But, but to point to what Eric said, I mean, reporting outputs and what we're doing with the money is not the same thing as an evaluation of how effective it is. And that butts up against the problem that Rich mentioned, every dollar you spend on that is not a dollar that you spend on delivering the services. And it's a real, a real problem. Perhaps at some point we could have greater discussions with, with Bonnie and their experience with the Shriver projects on the issues of trying to do follow-up and some, some impact. I know one of the grantees under the Shriver did have to spend some resources on following up on what happened to the people when they, on their housing project, when they lost the housing, where did they end up going and so on. But that starts becoming very, very expensive. And, and I think, uh, though I agree with Rich and Eric that we ought to do more in that area, we got to be cognizant of the allocation of resources and whether or not the legislation that creates the resources that the commission has, whether or not we even have the flexibility to spend it that way. Or whether we should ask for money to do that. Yeah. Bonnie, uh, no, Bonnie, you're back. Yeah. Okay. We're I'm only back. Ready. I'm only back because I'm done. But, uh, there are more questions. So please, Bonnie, you go ahead. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Um, I'll just say that um, indeed the the work that um, was done on main benefits and and having consistent structure is exactly what we're using for the um, evaluations to say what was accomplished um, with the funding and. Um, that said, we have 101 organizations, and and sometimes when one is looking at um, the numbers, it's you know we're we're continually trying to verify and validate. Um, but that work has been enormously helpful. So it is not just outputs; it is it is outcomes, and um, really, and again, really appreciate the work. and And you're right, Jen. It is extremely challenging. We spend about 250000 a year on, or we're spending 250000 a year on evaluation for the Shriver project um, for, and, and that kind of follow-up with clients trying to identify what happens when they um, are, you know, potentially have lost their housing is, is uh, not an inexpensive process <laughs> uh, to try and track people down and have those conversations. So the good news is we have that data and we can use that to inform what's going on because chances are it really isn't that different. Um, but uh, I think that's part of our hope is that we can pull together the various research efforts that are going on to help build the um, general picture of, of what's happening in legal services. Thank you. All right, Bonham Shay, last word. All right, very good. First, my apologies for not being here earlier. Um, I had a conflict, two conflicts um, with this uh, time, but I'm happy to be able to make the last hour or so. I know that um, the acknowledgments to uh, my colleagues, Kim and Rich, have already been made, but I, I can um, take some time to just really really share with you to the servant leadership, the wisdom, the depth of your experience, your tireless commitment to this work and how you have both just been stewards um, through, you know, so much in terms of ups and downs and turmoil and how you have worked with the commission past and present and have set such an example for the future. Um, I believe that as a result of your time here and the footprint that you're leaving behind, we are stronger as we're moving forward. So thank you both. And um, I, I honestly don't know how uh, these two shoes will be filled. Um, these two seats will be filled with your insights and um, just straight forward talk. And it's always coming from a place of contribution um, and impact. So thank you both. And um, I don't know, I can't really, thank you doesn't, doesn't uh, cut it. If we were in person, we would be celebrating right now and there'd be some wine and there would be 
other things, but hopefully we'll be seeing each other um, uh, because we are definitely now friends beyond just being colleagues here. So thank you both. Thank you. That was wonderful. Zoom hug. <laughs> All right. Uh, Kim, do you want to say goodbye? You're on mute. I think I, you know, pretty much said at the beginning, you know, my hopes for the commission being uh, continuing to operate with integrity and keeping foremost in mind um, that we are here to um, increase access to justice in California and that we work with integrity and that we, our job is to make sure we see that, um, that there is compliance with the statute, but that we understand the challenges of working with um, the programs, have flexibility, the importance of a partnership with staff, understanding what lane the commission is in, what lane the staff is in, and where we are partners. Um, and that we operate as a commissioners with uh, trust of each other and uh, ultimately reach a consensus after whatever necessary dialogue we have. So I just, since I kind of said most of that at the beginning, I just thought I'd wrap it up at the end with the same thing, but it's been a pleasure working with all of you. Um, and um, I look forward to seeing you in other opportunities. I'm humbled by your remarks, Bonnie. Thank you all. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Rich.